My name is Valadin. I'm 25, and I moved to Kentucky from Vladivostok when I was 10 years old. My parents divorced, and I went with my father, while my mother stayed in Russia. My father served in the Soviet military, specifically in the VDV. He was diagnosed with cancer when I was 19, and sadly passed six months later. He left me all of his military gear that he kept when the USSR collapsed, including his rifle and the cabin that he owns in the south of Kentucky, close to the Tennessee border. This information is purely contextual. My father trained me very well in survival, so that I could be strong like him. I spent much time camping and hiking. I had a couple of friends who would often come with me while in high school, Grisha from Serbian descent and James, a redneck. After high school though, James and I got out of touch, but Grisha and I remained close. One day, James texted me and asked if I wanted to go camping. I felt like this would be a good chance to rekindle our friendship, and I offered to have us camp at my father's old cabin. He asked if he could bring his new girlfriend, and I said it would be fine. But not wanting to feel like a third wheel at my own party, I thought I'd invite Grisha along too. Unfortunately, he was busy with work, so he couldn't come. Fast forward two weeks, and I drive up to the mountains and go to my father's old cabin, which is now mine. I parked my SUV, grabbed my backpack full of gear, spare clothes including my father's old VDV uniform, MREs and my rifle. I had brought 500 rounds of ammo with me, and I began to settle in, lit the fireplace, laid out my sleeping bag in the loft, and broke out a bottle of vodka. James was due to arrive the following evening. I had a few drinks and the sun was setting, so I cooked up some MRE eggs and bacon, and after eating, I went to use the outhouse. I sat in the outhouse doing my business. I was quite excited to be away from work and reconnecting with my friend. When I left the outhouse, something smelled awful. It's like the smell of rotten eggs, but I brushed it off as one of the various scents of being in the wilderness and returned back to the cabin, trying to forget about the odd scent. I drank some more vodka and went to sleep. Turns out I slept like a rock for almost a day, and I awoke with a bad hangover. After being awake for a little while, I brewed myself some coffee, when I heard tires coming up the driveway. In my haze, I had forgotten that James was coming. I was on edge and grabbed my rifle. When I looked out the window to see a beaten up Dodge Ram coming up the road, then I remembered and it all clicked. I felt happy when I saw James driving it, until I saw who was sitting next to him. It wasn't just his girlfriend, it was one of my exes. Her name was Alicia. My stomach began to turn. We had broken up less than three months ago. I wasn't really sure how to handle this situation. I felt angry, but still wanted to fix our friendship. He got out of the truck. His loud country music was loud enough to scare off much of the wildlife, which gets on my nerves. They came in and sat in total silence. The tension was so heavy in the air, you could cut it with a knife. Man, you guys are pretty awkward. Have you met before? I became angry and just said, Ask her. I could see Alicia's face shift to one of anger. Listen, you Euro trash, you're the one who said I could come. We don't need your crap to start. James asked her to calm down, and they stepped outside, and I'm assuming she explained everything to him. James came back inside without her and was quite angry. He slapped me across the face and asked me why I had cheated on her. I hadn't. It was the other way around. I was angry that she lied about me, and then being slapped had pushed me over the edge, and I punched him in the face and pinned him against the wall with my forearm against his throat, and asked him what his problem was. He spat in my face and asked me to let him go. I started to twitch with anger. 
We then heard Alicia scream outside, and she threw the door open. I released him from my grip, and he gasped for breath, and I began to calm down, as did he. James asked what was happening. She yelled out that she saw someone outside. She was sweating and her face was white. What do you mean you saw someone? James probed. I saw a big man in the woods. He was... He, uh, he looked like he was wearing a goat mask. It's got to be some silly, psycho, hillbilly, satanic cultist, we thought. I broke my silence and called her out. This is my family land. There's no one around for miles. The closest neighbour is five miles away. She called me an ass and told me that if I didn't go look, she was going to call the cops and say that I hit her. I wanted to avoid dealing with the police, so I grabbed my father's old rifle and stepped out. I looked angrily at James and said, You really just going to sit here and let her do this? You're some kind of friend. I walked out. The sky was clear, and the moon illuminated the clearing that the cabin sat in. I put a 30 round magazine into my rifle and readied myself. I silently prayed to St. Michael and walked to the back of the cabin and held my rifle in the low ready position. I heard a branch snap in the forest. I looked in that direction and pointed my rifle towards the sound. I heard the sound of the cabin door shut and then I heard two car doors shut as well. James' truck started and floored it down the road. James yelled out the window, Screw you and your communist dad, you can get killed by the cultist. I thought, thanks, arse. I was distracted enough to forget about whatever was in the forest, but then I heard something saying what James had just said. It sounded like, screw you and your communist dad, but it sounded wrong. It sounded like an animal was trying to talk like one of those cats or dogs you see on YouTube. But it was trying to put together a sentence. Then I realized I could smell the rotten egg smell. I began to yell in Russian to seem intimidating. That is when I saw a pair of yellow eyes rise up. They had to be eight feet off the ground, and I knew it wasn't normal. I heard my dad's voice in my head. He's the one who told me to never be afraid to defend yourself. I grew angry that this person was mocking my painful situation and that they were trespassing. I unloaded all 30 rounds and grabbed the spare magazine in my back pocket and began to back towards the cabin. I made it back inside. I threw the bar over the door and sat without sleeping. And I heard it outside still, mocking my voice and James's and Alicia's voices, mimicking what we had said. I eventually passed out due to running out of adrenaline. I woke up, grabbed my stuff, and left. I never heard from James or the she-devil again, and I have been back to the cabin often, but have never seen anything since. One year when I was about 15, I went to a scout camp in Bear Lake in Idaho. I haven't forgotten about it since, and I still honestly believe, I saw something supernatural. The whole week we were there, it had been mostly sunny and warm, but one day it got really cloudy and stormy. It started out as a drizzle during the day, but quickly turned into a torrential downpour at night. The campsite troop was assigned to us that night on the bank of the lake, towards the south end. Anyway, I woke up in the middle of the night. It was pitch black and the wind was howling like a chorus of upset toddlers. The reason I had to wake up? I needed to pee like crazy. So we have this buddy rule that if you go anywhere, you need to bring your buddy with you, especially at night. It's not called Bear Lake for nothing. So I wake him up and tell him I need to go. He groggily says, are you serious? When he saw me wiggling like a madman, he got out of his sleeping bag, grabbed his flashlight and jacket, and we get our boots on and unzip the tent. Instantly, we become drenched. We start walking towards the outhouse when about midway there, we hear this loud ass roar. 
thinking it was a bear, I start to panic. We turned around but couldn't see anything without our flashlights. Suddenly, a flash of lightning illuminates the sky, and we see a creature with a massive wingspan, a long neck, spiked tail, and as it flew over us, we could see the silhouette of it, its wings in a downbeat. As it passes, the air from the downbeat literally pushes us into the mud. Terrified, we run back to the tent and hide. Needless to say, I totally forgot about needing to pee until morning. To this day, me and my friend still talk about what we saw, and we both agree that it was a dragon. I love to share this story, because when I open with, I encountered a werewolf once, people are immediately intrigued by the absurdity of what I'm saying. These two stories happened almost a decade apart, and for obvious reasons, I cannot guarantee they are related at all, but it seems reasonable to at least entertain the idea. The first story takes place at my cousin's trailer, a couple of houses down from mine. We live in a rural town at the foot of the Appalachian region, so there's plenty of forest coverage around us. We were playing hide and seek and all was well, until I tagged my cousin and made him the seeker. He hated seeking, so instead of playing the game, he decided to sit and quit on his front porch. The time was around midnight, maybe a bit earlier, so naturally it was pitch black and perfect for scaring someone. My cousin's friend, my brother and I began to devise a plan to get revenge on my cousin for being a sore loser. And we came up with this. We were to lure him to the edge of the forest and my brother was to jump out at him. A very simple plan for a couple of 13 year olds. So we got to it. We managed to convince him that there was something making a noise in the woods. And so he came with us to investigate. As we walked to the edge of the forest, we heard something inside walking with us. I looked at my cousin's friend and we were both grinning, knowing it was my brother beyond those trees. Then out of nowhere, my brother bursts from the side of my cousin's trailer, screaming and roaring, sending all of us into a fearful panic. He got us good. So good, in fact, that we totally forgot about the noise coming from the forest that could no longer be attributed to my brother. As we were all laughing about the scare, we heard a horrifying noise coming from the depths behind us. It was a loud scream that sounded like a man screaming for help and slowly changed pitch. And to this day, I swear it said help. After about five seconds of human screaming sounds, it turned into the most guttural roar I've ever heard personally. It was chilling. We ran inside and my cousin opened the blinds to his windows. And it was right then we noticed the obvious and haunting sight of a full moon. Yes, we don't know what could have made that noise. Yes, there are farms around. It could have been a cow being attacked by coyotes or pretty much anything that happens in rural America, but I've never heard anything like it before or since. Jump forward nine years. I'm coming home late from work. As I'm driving, I see two bright orange eyes peering at me from the side of the dark road. I thought it may have been a fox or a dog, but as I got closer, I realized it was not your average fox or dog. It was a massive black wolf-like dog. The animal was so tall while on all fours that it seemed to be almost as big as my car. Its back legs were almost kangaroo-like, very long and muscular looking while the front legs were short and thin. It dashed across the road and in front of my car, jumping the fence to the left with no struggle. When I got home, I nonchalantly told my family that I finally got to see the werewolf that made the noise so many years ago. I don't necessarily believe that it's an actual werewolf, but I cannot honestly say it isn't. Anyway, I thought you guys might enjoy this story. Keep a keen eye out on full moon nights. Our family have links to both Ireland and Wales on both sides. So myself and my sister have a lot of Celtic blood in our veins. 
Some people say this makes you more sensitive to the paranormal or fae, little folk. But I'm still undecided on that. My dad worked as a professional medium and tarot reader, but did try and keep that side of things away from us as young children. However, it's hard to hide everything from a small nosy child. I still grew up with a keen interest in ghosts, ghouls, and monsters, and would read true stories of hauntings, and would scour the internet for photos and accounts. My sister, in comparison, hated anything paranormal and spooky, and was terrified of the dark and scary stories. At the time, we lived in a small council house on the edge of a town in southwest England. The house was on the end of a road, and behind our large overgrown garden was a lane that led directly to the countryside. My sister and I shared a bedroom at the back of the house, which was next to a small bathroom with a trap door that led to a large attic. Our house wasn't really all that sinister. It was probably around 70 years old, and the only activity we had really had was the ghost of a black Labrador. The door number on our house had a black lab on it, and my mum had one day seen a large black Labrador suddenly appear on the stairs, only to slowly fade away. Our neighbours confirmed that an old lady and her dog had lived here before us, the dog indeed being a Labrador, but I digress. But generally there was a happy atmosphere there, despite the stress my parents were under with money and family worries. Dad stayed at home and looked after us children, while Mum worked long hours as a support worker. Dad was funny, and would entertain us by putting on silly voices for our many soft toys. He also suffered from depression, and his moods could be variable. We were wary of this. We would often play quietly in our room to give them space when it happened. Our bedroom had a bunk bed, with the top bunk being close to the ceiling, and we would periodically swap between top and bottom. And I remember that when I was sleeping on the top, I would occasionally hear very loud footsteps crossing the attic. For whatever reason, this never bothered me, or I never thought it strange. It was so loud and heavy that when I outstretched my hand to touch the ceiling, I could feel the vibration from the footsteps through my fingertips. Why I never told my parents, I don't know. Thinking back now, it just seems quite strange and unnerving. Our attic wasn't joined to next door, and my parents would have had no reason to go up there. Dad was afraid of spiders, of which there would have been plenty, and Mum would not have physically been able to go up there. Anyway, one afternoon myself and my sister were playing in our bedroom. This particular day, Mum was working a long shift, and Dad had put himself to bed in the other bedroom next to ours as he wasn't feeling well. We could hear him snoring away, and were trying to keep our voices down. It's important to note that from where we were sitting in our room, we could see into the small landing, as we had no bedroom door at this point. There were a few soft clicking slash rapping noises from the bathroom next to us. We both instantly quieted, as we did not want to wake our dad and weren't sure if it was him making said noises. After the click, there came this sound. More of a voice, really. I can't describe it accurately. It sounded almost like our dad when he was putting on a funny voice. But if he had also been drunk and gargling water at the same time. My memory is hazy, but I believe, and my sister agrees, that it started off by saying hello, children although it was very hard to understand due to the almost underwater-like mumbling nature of it. That's when we realized the voice was coming from the bathroom. Unsure and thinking that it may have been our dad somehow, we laughed and said hello back. The voice cooed and said some more stuff, which I struggle to remember. I believe the general gist of it was that it wanted us to go into the bathroom. We were unsure. I think our voices may have gotten louder as we laughed at Dad's silly voice, when all of a sudden Mum and Dad's bedroom door flew open, and our very cross Dad emerged, very unhappy that we'd woken him. I remember being extremely confused. Hadn't he just been playing in the bathroom? We said as much, but being cross and sleepy he waved it off, 
especially after checking the bathroom and finding nothing amiss. He retreated back to his room, issuing dire threats if we were to wake him again. There was silence for a bit, and the realization settled in. That voice had not been our dad. We hadn't even seen or heard him come out of the room and into the bathroom, and we definitely would have given the no bedroom door thing. I remember feeling very scared and covering both myself and my sister in the blanket, and putting our heads underneath. We waited in silence for a few minutes, with me shushing her to be quiet as she was crying. Then the clicks came again. Was the trap door opening? And the awful voice began gobbling and gibbering in the bathroom again, this time sounding louder and almost angrier. Well, that was enough. Not caring anymore, we screamed for dad, and he came rushing out of the room. Seeing how afraid we were, he finally realized we weren't playing. He checked the bathroom, and even put his head into the attic with a torch to check that nothing was there. We all went downstairs, feeling a bit shaken. But being children, we soon distracted ourselves with video games and other things. Mum came home, and reassured us, saying that it might have just been our imaginations or people on the street making noise. We accepted this, but I do remember being a little uneasy using the bathroom, especially at night. We moved out not too long after, to a house that definitely did have some supernatural activity. But that's a story for another day, though. My sister denied that this incident ever happened for a few years until we were helping out folks clear some old boxes from the garage. We found her old diary tucked away in one of the containers, and she had written about that day, calling the thing a goblin, and even had drawn a little picture of the two of us hiding under the quilt. She then admitted she had remembered it, but thought it had just been a bad dream. To this day, I still don't know what that thing was. A human person could have gotten up there, but surely they would have been spotted when Dad climbed up with the torch. It was also super difficult to open the trap door without a ladder handy. If it was supernatural, then why did it want to lure two girls into the attic? Some people say that Faye will try and lure children away. So maybe it was that. Although I love anything supernatural, I will always try to find the rational explanation. If anyone has any ideas or thoughts on what it could have been, I'd love to know. I worked at the County Historic Preservation in Southern Appalachia, working on buildings and properties the county owned. One of the benefits included with my job was living on site at one of the historic properties. The historic house was an imposing brick mansion built in the 1810s, and I lived in a small caretaker's house about 20 feet away. This was in the backwoods, so to deter trespassers and vandalism, the county had built an eight-foot-tall fence around the entire five-acre parcel and put barbed wire atop of the fence. I mention all of this just to show that it was basically impossible for anyone or anything to jump over or climb over the fencing and onto the property. One night after working late at another property, I pulled up to my entrance gate, let myself in, locked it behind me and then drove the 100 yards down to the gravel road to my house. There were no lights on the property, so I could only see by my headlights. As I turned my car around the corner of one of the outbuildings and parked it, my lights shone on a thing that I still have a hard time describing effectively. It was the size of a deer, but with long spindly legs and long shaggy hair almost like a taller manned wolf, if you've seen pictures of those. That alone shook me. There was no way that something of that size should have been able to get through or over my fencing. What follows is absolutely true. I got out my car to get a better look at what the hell the thing was, and as I opened the door to go out, the thing took off running, not on four legs, but on two. I literally watched this thing raise its back up, stand at full height on its back legs and sprint away. I absolutely freaked out at that point, grabbed my mag light and my shotgun out from inside and tried to find the thing again. But there were no traces, no tracks, no anything. I have no idea how it got in or out of my property. 
I didn't sleep well that night. I just sat on my couch with my shotgun watching the front door hoping that whatever I saw didn't come back and burst in. I cannot explain what the hell I saw that night, but it still raises the hair on my neck every time I think about it. This happened about four years ago now. It was the 4th of July. A few of my friends wanted to do something instead of just lounge in front of our computers like we did every day. There were five of us. Me, Neil, Elijah, JD, and Neil's sister Katie. Neil had the idea to go to his grandparents' house as they owned a farmhouse. We live in Texas. So having that much space especially with other houses being half a mile out, it was the perfect place to pop fireworks without getting into too much trouble. The drive from where we lived to their house was about a 40 mile drive. Unfortunately, the only car we had at our hands was a two door, so trying to fit five of us into one car was hectic to say the least. The drive was actually tolerable, Three of my friends in the back found a comfortable yet funny position to sit in the car. The music Katie was playing was helping a lot and definitely passed the time. We all bought some fireworks halfway there and my friends jumped back into their designated position for another 20 miles. As we got there, Neil forgot to mention that his grandparents were out of town for the week, which made the experience ahead of us even better. All of us got out of the car except for Katie, who suggested she would get us all food and sodas for the night. She kept the fireworks in the back because she didn't want us popping any while she was gone. She drove off, and all of us were left without fireworks. So we did the next best thing, and went to the pool in the back. Something that already put me off was that the ranch sat considerably near a forest. Neil even went the extra step to tell me that there are occasional wolves that can be a hassle to deal with. Of course, I got nervous because I had nothing to defend myself with if one jumped over the fence. He handed me his pocket knife, saying that there's a shotgun in the living room if something goes down. He mentioned that he was going to set up a game of risk for us to play while Katie was gone, as the drive to the nearest market was over a few miles away. So Elijah and I sat poolside telling stories to each other about stupid stuff that happened while we were in college. During our talk, I was staring out into the forest line, paranoid about the aforementioned wolves that Neil teased me about. I saw something move. I couldn't tell since the porch light behind me was making it harder to see any details, but the way it moved made my heart jump. Elijah could see my body language change as I leaned in to see what was there. He started to ask me what I saw, and I thought I saw a wolf on the tree line. He looked towards where I pointed and calmed down. That's just Katie, dude. She's trying to scare us. He started calling her name, waving his arm and laughing, saying how she scared the hell out of me. Neil came out of the house wondering what Elijah was screaming about. Then he saw his sister standing in the field. He started to laugh when Elijah told him what happened and how I was on the edge of my seat. JD came out of the house next, and Neil told him to help Katie with the bags and grab the fireworks. Katie, who was out in the field, started to wave back. But the wave definitely seemed out of place. It wasn't so much of a wave as a jerk motion, like you were trying to pop your elbow. Elijah yelled for Katie to come back so that we could start the party, but JD came back with a terrified look on his face. Katie's not back yet. I just called her. She's still on the road to Walmart. The laughing died abruptly, and Elijah's face faded. His arm fell on top of his lap with a thud. Everyone looked at the still jerking figure in the field. Then... She screamed. The scream was so loud it sounded like it may as well have been a few feet in front of us. We all scrambled, running to the house, slamming the door behind us. Neil shouted for us to all lock the doors, 
and to grab the shotgun in our living room. I ran to grab his shotgun, as it was the closest thing to us, while the other two ran to each of the doors leading outside. Quickly, I grabbed the shotgun and stuffed a few shells into my pocket, running back to the kitchen where we came from, and handed the gun to Neil. I pulled out the shells, set them on the counter, and he loaded one in. JD came back covered in sweat, freaking out, and shouting about what the hell was that thing. We were all just as scared as each other. I look at them both, Elijah quickly joining us again. You don't think it was a, uh, one of those skinwalkers, do you? I've read stories on 4chan and creepypastas, but I thought it was all fake. JD reassured us, saying that that was just children's tales, and to not believe nonsense we read on the internet, and that he was fairly sure it was Katie, pulling a very elaborate prank. Cut the bullshit, JD. That scream wasn't human. He turned back to the door, pushing the blind slightly, to find that Katie was closer to us. It stood at the gates of the pool illuminated by the light and revealing to us something that didn't look much like Katie at all. The hair was a mess. The clothes looked tattered. Her skin bruised. The one thing that caught our eye the most was her face. Her head was tilted almost as if it was struggling to support the weight. The eyes were blank. The jaw was agape. It raised an arm jerking, as it did before in a mock wave. The jerking, however, started to get more violent, and the entire body began shaking uncontrollably. Neil quickly closed the curtains and backed off. He ordered us to sit back behind the counter and set himself in the gap leading into the kitchen, gun aimed at the door. It was silent for what felt like an hour. The three of us continued to look at Neil, who was completely focused on the door. A massive, grotesque smell entered our noses, as all of us reacted appropriately. The horrid stench was like if you left groceries to ferment in a box in the summer heat, with a few carcasses as garnish. It was hard to breathe, tasting the smell in the back of your throat, even with your nose pinched. It was so bad, JD actually threw up. Then, without warning, the smell was gone. The hot air that was the smell went away, and suddenly it was easier to breathe. I was afraid to let go of my nose, but was rewarded with a breath of fresh air. Everyone took a couple of breaths to rid their lungs of the pugnant smell that lingered beforehand. Neil asked us if we were okay, and we all replied. JD being an exception, as he puked. We heard what sounded like a whine. It sounded like a mix between a dog and a child about to cry. It wasn't coming from the porch door, but from the front, where we came in front of the car. All of us stood up. Neil moving forward while we stayed back. We knelt down by the stairs, still hearing the whining. It didn't hit me until we positioned ourselves, but it sounded like something was trying to talk for the first time. In a raspy, high-pitched voice, I could make out small portions of sounds. It kept repeating sounds, until it started to sound more enunciated. It sounded like JD. Same accent, same speech pattern, nearly the same voice. JD started to shiver and shouted back in a scared voice to leave and get out now. But the thing imitated him. The last words that were heard were in the same scream we heard when we saw it initially. It began pounding on the door, not like it was trying to force itself in, but like an impatient knock. It started to scream in the same pitch we heard it when we initially saw it. It terrified all of us. The inhuman screams, the polite pounding on the door. I started crying. I thought this was it. Neil wasn't scared like us though. He was pissed. He stood up, storming towards the door screaming. 
He swung open the door, pointed his shotgun at whatever was on the other side, pulling the trigger, filling all our ears with the sound of the shotgun blast and the ringing to follow. Neil stood at the door, huffing. His body language was wanting to rip this thing apart. I stood up, looking past his arm, seeing nothing but a shell on the ground. I looked up past his shoulders, seeing nothing but the driveway and the road leading back to where we came from. He turned around, the adrenaline fading away, and a shaky voice coming from his mouth. We're not staying here. JD, call Katie. Tell her to come back. The rest of the time, all of us were in the kitchen. The shotgun sat on the counter with several shells near the butt of the gun. None of us wanted to say anything. None of us wanted to look at each other. It was nothing but silence, until Katie called us. Neil quickly wrote a note, leaving it on the gun as we left. All of us hopped into the car, silent. Katie noticed our behaviour and constantly egged us to tell her what happened. She pouted, put her music on the radio to cheer us up. But the only thing I could hear was the blood-curdling scream, telling us to get out. I live in Wyoming, Michigan, about a walking distance away from a resurrection cemetery. If you look it up on Google Maps, you'll see it has a tree line surrounding it. The tree line closest to the woods is where I've seen something multiple times. It's, well, you can determine what it is for yourself. The first encounter I had with it was with my sister. She was going to walk through the cemetery. It was late at night, and I had the gut instinct to go with her, so I did. We were playing Pokemon Go, and I didn't like the forested area around it, especially this large pine tree. That, via a maintenance path, led to the crematorium. I was scared out my mind, but we went towards the crematorium anyway to get a Pokestop and find a Jigglypuff. We had to go so close that we were now on the maintenance path, but the nice cobblestone half. It was when I looked to my right that I saw the creature, hunched over. It almost looked like a normal human being, but more terrifying. It appeared to have seen me too because it stood up. It was tall, at least seven feet in height. I told my sister to run and we legged it home, where I proceeded to pray in my room for a while. My mum had a sighting too. She mentioned seeing it, something grey, hunched over the top of the pine tree. She mentioned seeing something grey and hunched over, in the top of the pine tree. When she looked back though, it was gone. Safe to say, we went home early that day. I consider myself a little bit sensitive, and when I close my eyes sometimes around that area, I think I can see it the two gaping holes staring back at me. My mum described the creature, and I recognised it as something I'd drawn a few weeks ago. I burned this image, but have since redrawn it. My most recent sighting, and the one that kept me from returning to the cemetery, happened in broad daylight with a friend. His name is Ma. We wandered around the cemetery for hours until my arms started hurting, and I decided that we should go home for a snack. As we walked, my anxiety heightened. I told him about this creature, but I suspected we wouldn't have to worry as it was daytime. As we were walking along the sidewalk, about to reach the tree line, I saw a dead squirrel and dog in the middle of the sidewalk. I looked up, and I see the crawler running straight past into the tree line. It was grey, and ran on all fours rather than two legs. I told my friend to run, and he did. We both ran until we reached the intersection. I would appreciate any advice on what the hell this is. I should start by telling you a bit about myself. I'm a guy in my twenties. I'm six foot four. I'm a vet, student, and trained kickboxing. There isn't much that scares me and people can regard me as an intimidating dude. My university 
is on top of a hill outside of town. From my dorm window on the seventh floor, I can see huge wheat fields in the nearby forest. My first encounter was last year. I have a German shepherd called Hades and a husky pup called Ragnar. That day, I left uni quite late. It was already dark outside. Usually I don't mind taking them out at night as I can let them run without their leashes. They are trained and I know they're gonna listen to me. Besides, I know everyone knew them and wouldn't hurt them if they were left out. They have collars that light up since Hades is fully black and Ragnar is fully white, which makes it hard to see him during the winter if I could see them all the time. We walked for a while and they were playing and running around. And at some point, Hades stops and starts growling, looking into the wheat fields down the hill. I didn't think about it. There are bats, owls, and other critters around us. I leashed them, not wanting to run after them if they decided to go chase something. About half an hour of non-stop growling later, I'd had enough and decided to take Hades home and go out so that Ragnar can run a bit more. I got home and expected him to go into his cage. He likes sleeping there and I never lock it. But that night, all he did was stand at the window looking out. Since the pup was whining and wanting to go out again, I tried to drag Hades into the cage and lock him until I got back. Who knew? Maybe he might be trying to go out the window. I got a look and on the parking lot, I saw a dark figure circling the cars. Thinking that it might be some local trying to steal something, I grabbed my flashlight and shone it at it. It wasn't a thief. In fact, I wouldn't say it was human at all. It looked up, eyes reflecting the light from the flashlight. It was black. Its head looked very similar to Hades. It was standing on all fours, but when I shone the light, it stood up. The roof of the cars barely reaching its midsection. It let out a growl, which I later learned that many of the tenants heard. Hades then went wild, trying to bust out the cage. Ragnar was whining ever louder. I realized he didn't want to go out. He was trying to get as far away from the window as possible. The growl made me flinch and I dropped the flashlight through the window. I tried to see it again, but it was too dark. I heard the crunching of snow as it left. The next morning, I went to find my flashlight and found huge dog-like footprints in the snow and a foul smell that still lingered. I borrowed infrared binoculars from a hunter friend of mine ever since, and I've seen it four times in the forest, twice crossing the field, and once it's come near the hill to look up. I and my roommate have been taking turns keeping watch at night when Hades starts growling. I don't take the dogs out at night, and Ragnar doesn't play and run around anymore. He just stays pressed against my feet. I hope he grows out of it. My friend and I used to go camping a lot in the El Dorado National Forest. We had a spot along Sapaigo Springs where we used to camp plenty. When we came, we decided to go there for a three day foraging camp we brought in MREs in case we couldn't find anything, some guns and some supplies to set up a shelter, but that's about it. First night was chill. We cooked a bunch of crawdads and a squirrel my buddy shot, drank a few beers we bought and slept fine. The next day, something felt off. One of my friends who was with me, and I'd had some really creepy experiences in this part of the forest in the past, and it felt a bit like the forests were dead silent, and you felt something watching you. I grew up in the woods, so I knew the sign of a predator, but this felt different than a bear or a mountain lion. When night fell, my friends went 200 yards or so up the stream to do some stuff, and I was alone in camp. The feeling got even stronger, so I built up the fire nice and big and grabbed a gun. I kept hearing faint voices from the woods in the opposite direction of where my friends went. They were low, indistinct sounds, but they were creeping me out majorly, and my buddies had taken the only two flashlights, which was poor planning in hindsight, as I peered out into the darkness. 
when I caught a glimpse of something moving 50 yards or so out of the trees. I snapped the rifle to my shoulder and got the scope on it. It was pretty dark and the only light was from the fire, but I could see the outline of what I was aiming at. It looked human, but was on all fours, and its arms seemed a lot longer than they should have been. It stood a bit like an ape, but very low to the ground. I only saw it for a second before it lopped over deeper into the woods. After I lost track of it, I hear light rustling in different directions around the camp. Leaves scuffling, the occasional twig snapping, and away from where my friends went. I'm 180% on the other side of the camp from their departure, and I got the sense that that is what was stalking me. I kept the fire high and was staying sharp looking out into the woods, but I didn't see it again. My buddies came back about 10 minutes later to find me a paranoid wreck glassing the tree line with a scope. I told them what happened and they got quiet, then told me the reason they came back when they did is they started hearing the same thing I did over by where they were at, and it spooked them something fierce. We spent the second night of our trip with our big ass fire and three lookouts. No one slept that night. In the morning we broke camp as quickly as we could and hightailed it out of there and have never returned to that spot to go camping. I'm a 17 year old female who only recently found out about these communities. I grew up watching ghost adventures and fact or fiction, paranormal files, all total BS, but it just goes to show that I've always been aware and interested in this stuff. But after hearing others' experiences, I figured I should share some of my own in hopes of getting any advice or answers as to what could be messing with me. I live in Florida and have always been aware of many Native American cultures, even though I'm not of heritage myself. Not sure if this is pertinent, but I timelined it and tried to write down everything I remembered about these experiences. It started from when I was very young, and the first instance of this happened when I was living with my grandmother. Her and I were very close. This will play a part later. You see, I was wide awake in bed, unable to sleep with her to my right. There was no doubt in my mind that she was deeply asleep, only a few inches from me. Every television in the house was off and the only other person in the house was my grandfather who was asleep in his room. Then very clearly and loudly I hear my grandma call me from the kitchen, almost how you'd be called for dinner. I know it's common to hear your name being called mistakenly, but I did more research on this as a teen. And apparently when you hear your name being called this loud, you're supposed to reject it, but I didn't. Not knowing this, I hustled closer to my grandmother and kept my eyes locked on the open door. The second instance was when I was around 13, when my father took me on a family trip to Las Vegas. We visited some part of the Grand Canyon, and while my family were waiting in line for a skywalk bridge we had paid a tour for, I wandered around the edge a good distance away from my family and decided to yell my name into the canyon to hear my echo. When it came back to me, it sounded distorted and almost like grandmother had yelled my name back. It might have not been my grandmother exactly, but it sounded very similar. Nevertheless, just the fact that it was distorted was enough to scare me a little. I don't put too much weight into this experience because it might have just been my voice being thrown weird. The next one happened when I was 13 or 14 as well was the most terrifying one I've ever had happen. When I start telling this to people, I actually start tearing up. This is the closest I've ever been to whatever this thing was and proved the point that it was mimicking the people I care about. I was on a vacation with my family to Key West and had rented a home. I invited my best friend who is called Ash to stay with us. On the third day, we had decided to skip out on the boating trip and mooch off the house owner's Netflix all day. On the fifth episode of whatever we were watching, we decided to refill snacks and have a bathroom break. We pause the television and I make my way to the kitchen. I think Ash had followed me into the kitchen 
and when I leaned on the island while I was preparing some chips with my back turned to her, I held a full conversation with whatever that thing was, and even looked back at her on her phone. I fully had no doubt in my mind that I was talking and looking at Ash on her phone. I turned my back for a split second to pick up the bowls and suggest we head back to the couch. When I see Ash, or should I say, the real Ash, walk out the bathroom, which was a solid 30 feet away. My body immediately went cold, and the first thing I asked her was how she got into the bathroom without me hearing. She then gave me the weirdest look and told me that she'd been in there the whole time since we got up. This is where I start freaking out and insisting that I had just been there speaking with her and physically saw her. She joked about doppelgangers and how maybe she was going to die. I quickly suggested we get out of the house and walk around the neighborhood. She then informed me she'd gotten her period while she was in the bathroom at the same time that I was talking to whatever I was talking to. We walked around until my mum came and she was back in the house. We're still best friends to this day and have been for 11 years and I asked her about it today before I decided to jot this all down and she said that she didn't hear me talking with anybody at all. Now at this point you guys must think I'm crazy but for this next one I have a witness. I felt a little less crazy after it happened with people who freaked out as much as me. Again on this occasion we were on vacation near the Great Smoky Mountains, just a little bit west of Sevierville, Tennessee. We had our previous reservations cancelled, so we took this little rundown cabin owned by a local woman. Now we got there late at night, and the moment we all stepped out the car, the first thing we heard was a man's voice saying, Hey neighbours, coming from a cabin to the left of ours that was higher up on the mountains where we were. We couldn't see the cabin really, just a road that led further up, so we assumed he could see us, but we couldn't see him. Probably some guy on his balcony. My friend's stepdad yelled, Hey! And we waved up towards the direction it came from. It wouldn't have been weird, if it hadn't have happened every time we stepped out of the cabin or car. My family completely wrote it off as some type of hospitality. We were not used to it in Miami. Retelling it, my brother and my friends agreed it was strange. We did hear constant footsteps around the cabin at night, and some outside my window. It was a raised cabin, probably a story or two off the ground, but I didn't give it too much thought, since wildlife is a thing in the woods. Just something I thought I should mention. The thing that really propelled me into researching what the hell was happening to me, was when I was having a photo shoot in the woods behind the cabin, and both my brother and sister and I heard something calling my name deeper in the woods. Since I was with my younger siblings, I went into full big sister protection mode and almost threw them back down the little slope we had to climb to get into the woods. We were all crapping ourselves from how clear it was and how we all pinpointed it was coming from deeper in the woods and nowhere near the cabin. This was all during the day and we were all so thrown by this that we stayed in for the rest of our trip. We all agreed it was a woman's voice, and the first thing I asked my mum when we got outside was, Did you call me? She had been lounging in her room with my stepdad all day, trusting that I would take care of the younger ones just outside the cabin. She saw how freaked out the kids were, and we didn't really go out at night for the rest of our trip. I think I reacted this badly to this one mostly, because I had kids to take care of, and I can tell they were terrified out there. Again, the voice sounded like someone was looking for me, or calling me back somewhere. With no knowledge of what this could have been, I had finally decided to look into things when I turned 17. I had no previous knowledge of Wendigos or Skimwalkers or anything cryptic, only crappy ghost investigations and Zach Baggins making something out of a scratchy EVP. I'm desperate for answers at this point because I'm constantly thinking about it and driving myself into rabbit holes of information and myths and legends. If you've heard this, thank you so much. I really would appreciate any input. Much love to anyone who wishes to help.
I lived in Montana, on some land my dad owns, and I was hiking up a mountain like I do frequently. I heard this really weird screaming coming from the other side of the mountain, away from my house and deeper into the woods. It wasn't a mountain lion, too deep and long, and it went on for about 10 seconds, and I'm fairly confident it wasn't a bear. It kind of sounded like a human, almost distorted, almost like someone was possessed by something, sort of like what you'd hear in a horror movie. I got to the top of the mountain, pulled out my binoculars, and looked into the general direction of the scream. That's where I saw it. A weird, humanoid looking creature, as white as paper, and without any hair or clothes or genitals for that matter. And its arms were longer than its body. It had these huge black eyes that covered most of its face, and it was walking. But as soon as I saw it, it stopped and stared at me. I watched it carefully, I don't even know for how long, thinking that it was staring straight into my soul. I had to look away because my eyes had started watering from not blinking. When I looked back, after wiping my eyes, it was gone. I couldn't see it anymore, which made me think it was a weird hallucination or something. I decided to get the hell away from the area and ran back home. The scariest part is that five minutes after I walk in the door, I hear the scream again. It was much closer and made my ears ring. Now that I think about it, I remember that I could hear my dad yell at me whenever I needed help with something every other time I was up there. I'm pretty sure it was where I was standing where I first saw it. My dad heard it too, so it wasn't just a hallucination. And my neighbor was talking about the screams a week after it happened. I've researched it as best I could, but I've never found anything except a description. I've never seen it since, and my dad hasn't either. One of the many reasons I moved in with my mom in Arizona. I would often go camping with my grandparents, who I call my Gammy and Gampy. At the end of my school years, I would always look forward to it since I grew up loving the outdoors and the woods. I especially loved camping, loved the idea of having s'mores, taking long hikes, being around the campfire, and of course all the amazing wildlife I would see. Now I grew up in California, mostly near cities, so the forest to me was like my true home. I always preferred being near trees and dirt, rather than buildings and crowded places. Besides, the woods were much quieter and more peaceful, and I always felt safe when I was there, like nothing could ever hurt me. But something strange would always happen at the end of the month of May. I would have this recurring dream during the last two weeks of my school year. I'd be in the woods, walking alone down a dirt trail. The woods were always strangely quiet. I would continue to walk this path until I saw this red fox poke its head from behind a tree. Its eyes were always strangely human, but they were yellow and somehow looked like teddy bear eyes. And it would just stare at me. It wouldn't make a sound at all. It would just watch me, usually in my dream. I would go up and pet it, making the fox finally make a noise, usually a soft growl. Then I would continue walking and it would follow. The first time I would have this dream was when I was actually around five and it lasted until I was perhaps 11. Over the years, it would be the exact same thing. I would walk in the woods, find this fox, pet it, then continue on my hike with it alongside me. But about having this dream for the fourth time, it would start to walk behind me. That's when I started to feel a bit uneasy about this fox. I would hear it making odd noises, but every time I went to look back, it was walking like nothing was wrong. Even, somehow, giving me a smile. Now that the dream's out the way, I can talk to you about my first true encounter. I was six years old and going on a camping trip with my Grammy and Gampy for about a week. Of course, I was very excited for it, barely being able to keep myself in my school seat for the last day of kindergarten. They had picked me up right as the bell had rung and already had the camping trailer attached to my Gampy's trunk. I remember he drove an old red truck that only had three seats. 
me always being in the middle. It took about two hours to get there and another good hour to find our usual camping spot. It was deep in the woods and far from other people as my gammy wasn't too fond of being around other people while we camped. As they were getting up the camping trailer, I wandered around the campsite, loving to dig in the dirt for bugs. I had sat down on the dirt and started to dig when I noticed how strangely quiet the woods were. It was never quiet, not even in the dead of night. I thought it was odd, but being only six, I didn't think too hard about it as I continued to dig for bugs. However, I thought I heard my gammy call for me. She would usually call me Sugar Bugger, that being a nickname she gave me since I was born. That's what I heard, but it sounded like it was very far away and somewhat sick. I looked up, where I heard it coming from. That being from the woods, but there was no way she was there, because she was still unloading stuff from the truck. Even at the age of six, it didn't feel right. So I walked closer to my grandparents and stayed next to them. I soon forgot about my weird encounter though, as we began to have fun. For the rest of the day we played card games, sat next to the campfire as we ate dinner, and stared up into the stars. I always loved seeing the stars, there never being anywhere I lived. We started to get sleepy around nine, and we got ready for bed. There were bunk beds that my gammy and I would sleep on, keeping our luggage on the top bunk, and we would sleep on the bottom bunk. Due to my gampy's snoring, he would sleep on the couch of the trailer. I would always sleep next to the trailer window just in case I couldn't sleep and wanted to look outside. I fell asleep pretty quickly though, that being the last day of school and all, it was pretty exhausting. I remember waking up maybe hours later, it was still pitch black outside. It wasn't weird for me to wake up that late in the night since I always have had sleeping issues. I rolled onto my side, trying to fall back asleep until I heard it again. Sugar bugger. My eyes immediately shot open as I heard my nickname being spoken, but I knew it wasn't either of my grandparents. They were both asleep and were never known to sleep talk before. I started to feel this horrible feeling in my gut, like whatever I was hearing wanted to really hurt me. Even at the age of six, I knew this wasn't normal. Then I started to hear tapping at the trailer window. It was soft, but loud enough for me to hear it. I sat there frozen in fear. I was trying to brush it off as tree branches or rain. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. I could tell that it was really someone or something tapping on the window. Then I decided to be brave and look which was a big mistake. I pulled the curtains away to only peek, and what I saw were these large, yellow eyes. They seemed glassy, yet not entirely real. They looked like giant teddy bear eyes, but cold and unwelcoming. I remember in that moment I panicked, quickly closed the curtain back up, and then hid under the blanket, that being the only thing I knew to do when I saw a monster. I could feel tears falling down my face. I had never been so terrified in all my life. I just curled up into my Grammy's side and clung to her all night long. The dam tapping, only getting louder and more persistent throughout the night. I don't remember falling asleep, but somehow I did. And I remember my Gampy waking me up around noon, saying how if I'd gotten up quick enough, we could still go fishing. I honestly didn't want to leave the trailer at all, terrified that whatever I saw that night was out there. I did eventually go outside, but I was constantly looking around, horrified that whatever I saw would get me. My gammy immediately knew I was scared and pulled me into a hug. When she saw me, she asked what was wrong. I told her what I saw and heard, and surprisingly she believed me. The next thing I knew, she was telling my gampy that we were moving campsites. It took a little to convince him, but he did eventually start picking up and hook the trailer onto his truck. I was put into the truck so that I could probably sleep, but I couldn't. I kept feeling that I was being watched, 
thinking that every little noise was that thing I saw, and that if I opened my eyes for a second it would get me. My gammy wasn't too far away when I heard it again, but this time, it was my actual name. Aaliyah. At that moment, I had never seen my gammy move so fast. She looked up into the bushes when we heard it. Then she got into the truck with me and pulled me in tight in a protective hug. I began to cry all over again, telling her how I wanted to just go home. That's when my gampy got into the truck as well. And since I was sobbing so hard to the point I was coughing, he agreed he'd take me home. We started to head out of the campsite. Still heard that this trip had been ruined by something, but I still didn't know what. That's when something in my head told me to look back. I slowly did so, feeling an ice cold fear wash over me as I saw something. A red fox sitting in the middle of the campsite, sitting there with large yellow eyes. The same red fox from my dream, somehow curling its mouth into an eerie smile. After that encounter, we never did go back to the campsite. We did continue the camp, but in more populated areas. I didn't tell my grandma what I saw, but she told me to trust my gut. She knew that I was sensitive to certain entities and that it would help me if I trusted it. Now, this would be the end of the story, but it's not. There was one more encounter I had with this creature and it's much more terrifying than the first. The second encounter I had was when I was 17. By this time, I very well knew what a skinwalker was, and I was still very paranoid every time I went near wooded areas, still worried about seeing the fox, but I never really thought too much into it. Me and my two younger siblings were staying at a relative's house for Christmas, them living way up in a mountainous area. I think they were my great aunt and uncle, but I'm not sure. Where they lived, there isn't much reception at all, so unless we hooked onto their Wi-Fi, we basically had no phones. I didn't mind the house, still loved the woods no matter what happened. Although it irked me that they didn't close their window curtains, making it easy for anything outside to see in. But I did feel safe while inside the house, knowing that they wouldn't let anything happen to us kids. Luckily, it didn't snow where they lived, so we could all look outside and run around. They also had this beautiful, black Labrador about a year old called Pam. She was very playful and normally wouldn't listen to anyone but my uncle. Although she was easily excitable, she was a good puppy. One of the days we were there, my little sister and our aunt went out to the store for a nice girl's day. Although I'm a girl, I would rather have gone hiking with my uncle and my little brother. We left pretty early since the hike we were doing was four hours of walking into town. It was really chilly in the morning, but since we were doing so much walking, it felt great. We also decided to take Pam, it being a good way for her to get her exercise in and have fun. About an hour into our walk, I started to slow down a bit, wanting to enjoy the beautiful forest. It was so peaceful, I could have stayed there. But as we continued the walk, I began to feel something odd. I noticed how quiet the forest had suddenly become hearing only our footsteps and my brother talking to my uncle. Pam noticed it too, her ears going straight up and growling softly. I started to pick up my pace to get to my brother, worried that possibly a coyote or mountain lion was nearby. I knew that they wouldn't be out at this time though. Even if they were, they didn't walk near the roads. My little brother was only nine at the time and being the oldest sibling, my natural instincts to protect him kicked in. My uncle noticed the silence as well, telling us to stay close to him and Pam, who was now next to me and still growling. I began to feel that horrible feeling again, that ice cold fear I felt when I was six. I tried so hard to not think of the creature, but it was all I would worry about. I was scared. I felt like I was back to being that scared little six-year-old girl again. I had to stop for a moment though. Seeing my shoelace came undone, I quickly kneeled down to tie it back up, trying to hurry and just get out of there. But that's when I heard it. Aaliyah. 
At that moment, my heart dropped into my stomach. My eyes were widened and I could just feel myself start to shake from fear. It was right next to me. I heard it clear as day. I slowly turned my head and there it was. That same red fox still with those horrid yellow eyes and the same smile. Only this time I saw it much clearly. Its fur looked so matted and disgusting. The smell of it was like decaying flesh mixed with garbage. Its limbs were much too long for a normal fox, the back legs bending completely the wrong way. Those eyes were still the worst thing about it, but now they looked emptier than I remember. I wanted to scream, to run, to cry, but I couldn't. I was frozen, as I was too scared to even blink. But I heard it speak again. This time, however, it mimicked my little brother's voice. Found you... Before anything else could happen, Pam suddenly jumped in front of me and started to bark like mad, snapping and growling so aggressively that it scared me out of my frozen trance. When I looked back, it was gone. I used that moment to run over to my brother and uncle, who didn't see what I saw, as they were too far ahead now. But I heard my uncle start to pray and sing a little song under his breath, keeping my brother and myself close. I was too scared to look back, so I just kept my eyes on the ground and refused to stop walking. Pam had stopped barking, but she was still growling and never left my side as we continued our hike. My little brother was a bit worried, but he just thought it was a coyote. When we finally made it into town, my uncle had called our aunt and told her to pick us up, saying something about how it wasn't safe for us to walk back. Thankfully, she did come and get us, but she was confused since we talked about that hike for days. On the car ride back, Pam never left me alone. She was right with me the entire time. She knew that the thing was after me, and she protected me. I was very grateful that she was with us, as who knows what would have happened if she wasn't. When we got back to the house, I spoke with my uncle and aunt. Once I told them what happened and what I saw, they had started to pray and checked that all the locks were shut tightly. My aunt putting something around the doors, I think it was probably ashes, but I never did find out. Unfortunately, this made our Christmas vacation cut short as they were worried that I was not safe while in the woods. We had to be taken home the next day, them making an excuse of how there was an emergency with a friend and that they needed to help them out. I felt horrible that this Christmas was ruined, but once I left those woods, I did feel safe again. Before they had to drive me back home, though, they told me it wasn't my fault, and that luckily it didn't hurt me or the other kids. It did make me feel a bit better, but it still brought up a lot of questions and worries. Is it still around? How? Why? What did it want with me? Does it want my skin, my soul, or will I just be tormented by this thing forever? I still don't have the answers to these questions, and that is what really scares me. Now, I've long since moved from California and now live in Kentucky. I do live in the woods, but so far nothing has found me. While I'm happy it hasn't, the concern is still there. Can it still find me? Is it still hunting me? I'm not close to anyone who truly knows how to get rid of this thing, and that's why I'm sharing this story with you now, so that I can possibly find help. So please, if there's anyone out there who does know, help me. The year was 1995. I had just graduated high school, and an old friend who I hadn't spoken to in seven years now and I were hanging out and we mutually agreed to go to New Orleans. And we did. We had $140 between us, and back then that was more than enough. We made it to New Orleans, almost died from culture shock, and turned around and headed to Magnolia to get some sleep. We stayed at Magnolia Inn. It was a dump, but it was nice and cool in May or June. And in that state at that time of year, cool was the only adjective that mattered. We stayed up that night playing poker, drinking Gordon's vodka, and talking about who knows what.
probably girls, college, and college girls. At some point I said, ever been to Texas? Nope. So we packed our bags and started to roll. We had a road atlas and Marshall, Texas was right across the border from Shreveport. We arrived in Shreveport, made a phone call to another friend who we were actually supposed to be staying with. Both of our mothers had called looking for us and the only person that knew where we were was the buddy on the phone. It was no big deal. We knew that we would be home in a day or so. I'm being short of details here because I don't want to turn this into a novel about chasing armadillos and being chased off by the bogeyman. Before I left the rest area in Shreveport, when we made the call, we saw an armadillo. Let me tell you something about armadillos. Those little dastardly creatures will hiss, jump, and turn into Tasmanian devils if you corner them. They also carry leprosy. We were 18 and chased the armadillo around for an hour. Now let me tell you about Shreveport. I don't know how it is now, but in the summer of 95 it looked and smelled like a place where oil and metal went to die. It was dirty and a crap hole. We crossed a bridge and saw people fishing a hundred yards from where a drainage pipe from a factory was spewing filth. The locals reminded me of locals in Adamsville, bald-headed women and cross-eyed men. A lot of bald-headed, cross-eyed kids as well. I'm sorry, but to me it was a Rob Zombie movie come to life. I felt like my life was going to be over because I had a head full of hair and could see straight. The best part of Shreveport was an armadillo that might possibly have leprosy, and Marshall, Texas was 40 miles away, so we rolled on. Marshall was a decent little town, home of the Fire Ant Festival. We stopped at a little barbecue joint and had a coke, a smile, and some pulled pork. It was getting late, and the sun was setting. We looked at the map and decided to backtrack a bit, and headed up a rural route, 43, through Karnak and past Caddo Lake. We would eventually run to Highway 59, head to Texarkana, and then head back home. When we left the big barbecue joint and headed towards 43, it was dusk. Highway 43 wasn't well lit at all. My friend was driving and we were doing about 45. Any faster would have been reckless even for a couple of 18 year olds. This road was kind of like Christmasville Road. The non-locals just have to use your imagination. It was dark, winding, full of hills that ended in curves and there were beady glowing eyes on both sides of the road. You could hear crickets and the bullfrogs over the sound of the wind brushing by that old Sentra. It was peaceful and creepy at the same time. The humidity was a real thing, tangible. The air was thick. It smelled like pastures, hay, and swamp. We drove for what seemed like hours, and it was after midnight that I saw a sign that informed me that Bivens was the next town of any size. I was hypnotized by the yellow lines on the road. We hadn't seen another car in at least an hour. Sleepy, I rolled the window down and lit a cigarette. There was music coming from the radio, the tape player. It was either Tupac or Bob Sager. I smoked my cigarette, absent-mindedly flicking ashes out the window. I took one last puff and flicked the camel shot off into the woods, and then I saw it. I never looked to my right. I didn't even kind of peek to the right. Maybe I did a little when I flicked the cigarette away, I don't know. But what I do know is that in my peripheral, there was something running alongside the car. It was just behind my window, behind where the edge of the door ends, and before where the back window begins. I looked over at the speedometer, 40 miles an hour. I looked at my friend and he was looking straight ahead. I looked straight ahead. I could still see it. I could see one huge arm of matted hair of reddish brown, sticky looking and primal. I eased my right hand over and rolled up my window. My friend was still looking straight ahead, his jaw clenched, and he put both hands on the wheel. He sped up. No words were said. I looked straight ahead, and still out of my periphery I could see that arm moving, muscles and tendons visibly rippling beneath matted hair. As the car gained a little speed, the thing running alongside us lost pace, slightly. 
I then saw the hand at the end of the nightmarish arm. The hand was clenched into a fist the size of a cantaloupe, a big cantaloupe, and covered in the same hair but slightly darker around the fingers, like it was stained with something. Suddenly the hand unclenched, and then I saw the claws, black as this damned after midnight Texas night. Those claws were at least two inches long, sharp like an animal's. This wasn't a hand so much as it was a killing paw, and the claws of some beast whose only purpose was to kill and eat. I looked back at my friend. I looked at the speedometer, 50 miles an hour. I looked straight ahead and it was still there. I lit another cigarette, didn't roll the window down and simply said, crap. The music had stopped. I finally broke the silence and said, hey, do you? And before I could finish, my buddy said, I see it. I've been seeing it. I can't even see you, but I can see whatever the hell that thing is. How much do you see? More than I want to. Speed up, John, just speed up. It can't keep up forever. I looked down at the speedometer, 55 miles an hour. Whatever was chasing us silently was starting to lag behind. I finally looked over to my right just a bit. Imagine the scary part of the movie where you put your hand up in front of your face but still peek through. In 37 years, I have two regrets. One is picking up that first cigarette, and the other is me looking to my right that night. The beast was huge. Its chest was above the top of the car, and all I could see was that matted reddish-brown hair. Then it bent forward as it ran. I saw the face of this thing. All reality stopped. We were no longer driving down some country road in Texas. We were now trying to escape from the depths of a monster that inhabited hell. This thing's face is beyond my powers to describe. It was evil, the eyes were black, and the pupils were red. It flashed its teeth at me in a snarl, yellow and huge. Saliva dripped from its mouth. It opened its eyes wide, and it looked hungry and pissed off. Then it opened its mouth. The skin pulled back until all you could see were black gums and yellow teeth. Immediately I could feel the car accelerate. I just went. I prayed and cussed, lit a cigarette, and then like sunshine breaking through the clouds, the road straightened out. Don't you slow down. We drove through Bivens and drove through Texacana, and then we drove home. We never said a word. It was years later, 11 to be exact, before we even talked about it again, and we didn't even talk about it much. He said he'd never told anyone, and neither had I. I told the story a few years back for the first time while I was parked out on a gravel road, doing the things you do when you're parked out on gravel roads with a good-looking woman. I told it a year or so ago to a couple of kids who wanted to hear a scary story while they sat around a campfire. They didn't sleep for a day or two, but they asked me a dozen more times to tell them the story. And I never told anyone until now that I saw its face. I've been scared for my life exactly two times. Once was on that road, and the other was looking at a grizzly bear in front of me with a terminal velocity, including drop to the other side of me. Call it what you will. Call it crap if you want to. But look me in the eyes and let me tell you this story, and you'll know. Never doubt there are things in this world that defy explanation and logic. The bogeyman is real. Some 16 or 17 years after this happened, I ran across a story and a movie called The Legend of Bogey Creek, Falky, Arkansas, where the aforementioned story and movie takes place. It isn't that far from Bivens, Texas as the crow flies. Invite me over, buy me a beer, sit on the porch with me, and I'll tell you the story over a pack of Marlboros and a few of those beers. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and there is a stretch of road between me and my girlfriend's house that goes through some ranches and a wooded area. My girlfriend and I were driving back towards my house around 10 p.m., and while I was rounding a corner near the beginning of the woods, I swerved as I saw what looked like a tall, skinny, pale person standing by the side of the road and walking into it. 
When I looked in my rear view mirror to see what it was, I couldn't see anything. But after I asked my girlfriend about it, she was clearly shaken and said she saw it too. We decided to stop talking about it for the time being and continue to drive deeper into the woods back home. About 15 minutes down the road, we came across a fresh deer carcass on the side of the road. And while I noticed the deer carcass alone, as I was focusing on the narrow road, my girlfriend swears she saw the same figure bent over the carcass. I drove by that carcass for weeks after when I went back to her house. We've both seen a lot of weird stuff on that small stretch of road, including more on that specific drive. But now I know to be more wary on the road when I'm traveling late at night. This story was told to me by a childhood friend's dad. Me and my friend had known each other for quite some time. Most of that time he lived in town. This town has a population of 8,000, literally in the dead center of Illinois. On the edge of town on a country highway, there's the remnants of a small pig farm and slaughterhouse, which is now run down. The land of which his family used to hunt on since the 80s. You are eighth grad year, and he tells me he's moving out to the country, to a new neighborhood that's being built. Upscale homes, and his dad's been promoted at the local power plant. This was a mile from the farm slash slaughterhouse. I start staying out at his house much more than usual, because it was awesome. Lots of money had gone into it. We would explore the woods during the day, and this was around 98 to 99, and we would spend the nights inside listening to music and messing around with Yahoo chat groups. One day out in the woods, we came across a pond of a decent size. There's a small island in the middle. My friend sees this and immediately goes pale, telling me we've got to leave. We hightail it out of there without waiting for me, and I follow. I keep asking what's going on, but he won't tell me. We finally return to his parents' house and are sitting in the kitchen when we come in through the garage. They see his face and ask him what's wrong. He tells his dad he found the pond. His dad looks sick and I again ask what the hell is going on? Now his dad is a pretty straight laced fellow. Not really a sense of humor to speak of since I met him. I would only enjoy a glass of expensive whiskey when he was in the mood. He decides now is one of these moods. After getting his glass and taking a few sips, he makes us promise to stay away from there and tells us this story. When he was younger, his dad took him and his brother to hunt out there. This incident happened when he was 19 and well seasoned. They got out early and decided to set up by this pond. Slow day, only a few deer that weren't really worth anything. Starting to get the idea of a new spot, they heard a rustling from outside the pond across from them. It was a wolf, but those aren't here. Not a thing in our area, at least not capable of walking to the pond. Looking at it like it was investigating, then stood up on its hind legs, walked that way into the water, swam to the middle, but walked up to the island on two legs. And it stood there before lying down and seemingly fell asleep. They decided to wait to make sure it was out, then slowly backed away, getting back to the truck as quick as possible, never going to hunt back there again. Again, this was told to me quite some time ago, but it always stuck with me. My friend's dad never joked with us. He never seemed to have much of a sense of humor at all. My dog, typically sleeps right around my arm. His head rests on my shoulder so he's facing the window. When I sleep, the back of my head faces the window. It was nearing 5.30 a.m. The dog wakes me up with extremely aggressive growling at the window. This growling I've only heard when he fights with other dogs. I was roused and tried to coo him back to sleep. Within a few seconds, the growling turned into howls and barks. I looked outside the window and my heart rate shot through the roof. The property line from my house to my neighbors is 60 to 70 yards. I competed at state for track for the 100 open, 402 relays, so I can confirm the creature's speed was shocking. 
It covered the yard in no less than three seconds, with grey skin, long arms almost down to its knees and an elongated face, and anorexic looking legs. It ran by swinging its arms like a buffoon, not in runner's form at all. After collecting myself, I burst into my dad's room, startled him, but told him to go outside with me. We briskly got outside with handguns as I tried to explain what I saw. There were no footprints or marks, as white-tailed deer are frequent in our yard. Still wish I knew what the hell I saw that night. Me, my uncle and my grandfather are all avid outdoorsmen. We've heard it all, including bobcats during mating season, which if you haven't heard, sounds like a woman screaming. Quite honestly, this scared the crap out of me the first time I heard it when I was around 10, and honestly probably accounts for a lot of encounters that people claim to have out in the woods. As for my uncle, however, nothing ever phases him and he's the most down-to-earth, no-nonsense outdoorsman I know, and has had many close encounters with black bears, bobcats, and even a cougar. And he always shares these tales with the younger kids at the bonfires. At one time, he told me and my grandfather about something that he could not explain, something that chilled him straight to the bone and made him question how much he really does know about the woods. Now this takes place deep in the Appalachian Mountains, west of Boone, but I don't know the exact spot, as he would never say. Him and his buddy Brian were backpacking, as they had done many times before. He had a larger group that did this sort of thing every year, but this time it was just the two of them. Now this trail they are on is miles from any road, much less residency, and is not the sort of trail you would encounter other hikers on. This is pure wilderness. A few days into the hike, they set up camp overnight next to a stream they were following, cooked dinner, and then turned in their tents for the night. Sometime later, my uncle was awoken by something outside their camp. He listened intently, although he wasn't alarmed. Perhaps they had left food out, and a bear or raccoon had wandered up to snatch a quick bite. He then noticed that whatever was outside the tent was big, really big, and he could feel the impact of its feet hitting the ground. By now, he had grabbed his 44-point magnum and laid it on his chest, just in case, of course. He still wasn't alarmed as he had had many close encounters with bears before, and that's when he realized it. In the dead of the night, there were no sounds and the woods were oddly quiet, and he could hear the individual footsteps, and they were only two. Whatever was outside his tent was not walking on four legs, but two. At this point, he starts getting genuinely scared as the footsteps get closer and closer to the tent. He could now hear the heavy, raspy breaths of the creature, almost like a grunting sound that it took with each step. By now, his firearm was pointed right in the direction of the noise, he had no clue as to the height of the creature, but he could tell it was big, like a 300 pound man walking through his camp. And then he heard the creature simply slowly walk back into the woods going upstream and heard the leaves rustle a bit as it entered back into the forest. And then the return of silence. Upon waking up the next day, he thought he may have dreamt it when Brian came running up to him asking if he had heard whatever the hell was outside their camp that night. They immediately looked for tracks, but found nothing. The story doesn't end there, however. Sometime later, they went backpacking again around the same area, although not exactly the same. They were all sitting around the campfire when they heard a pack of coyotes howling, which is not uncommon in that part of the state. They were listening to the symphony when out of nowhere came a deadening noise that echoed all through the valley. He described it as if a really big 200 pound muscular man had taken a baseball bat and slammed it against a tree as hard as he could. The forest immediately went silent and not a single coyote howl or yip was heard again for the rest of the night. Now my uncle was dead serious when he was telling me this story and isn't the type to make up stories to sound cool. It's really against his character, 
and I believed every word he said. My grandfather offered little to no insight as to what it could have been. As for me, it does sound a lot like the other Bigfoot stories I've read online, especially for knocking. What do you guys think? I'd love to hear your own ideas. When I turned 18, my brother and his friends took me camping in a spot called the Devil's Hole in Barrington Tops, northwest of Sydney, Australia. It was just a typical camping spot, a clearing in the trees with enough room to set up a few tents and a fire pit in the middle. After a day of four-wheel driving in the roads around the campsite, we went hunting for firewood and gathered a sizable pile, including an entire fallen gum tree about 30 meters long. Night fell, the fire was roaring, and beer was being consumed in great quantities. As usual, people were going off into the trees frequently for a pee, making more room for more beer. At one point, I headed into the bush, to a spot I'd claimed as my own personal toilet. My brother followed me with a torch, since it was pitch black, and it's not a bad idea to stick together in the Australian bush. We walked along a small path, about 50 meters from the campsite. After emptying our bladders, we turned back around onto the same path. We went about five meters when we noticed something standing on the path. A kangaroo, probably, 1.5 meters tall, standing there looking at us. We didn't hear it approach, which was strange since it was fairly dense bush, and there were sticks and leaves all over the ground. The kangaroo bounded off into the darkness, revealing something even more unusual. Behind it, on the formerly empty path, were three sticks standing in a triangle shape tied together at the top. We went in for a closer look. It was the way back to the campsite anyway. Sitting on the top of three sticks was a small human-shaped figure made out of twigs. Underneath the triangle was a piece of tree bark covered in different colored paints. At this point, we were pretty confused, but being a pair of drunk idiots, we picked up the stuff and headed back to the campsite and threw it in the fire. We didn't see any other signs of kangaroos, or wildlife really in general, over the rest of the time there, another day and night. Just that one lone kangaroo that appeared out of thin air. After a few years, I did some research, and it's possible we encountered a cordaicha an aboriginal ritual executioner, sometimes compared to a skinwalker. My dad once told me a story about a creature he once saw, something I believe was a skinwalker. This was in the very early 80s, in late fall, before I was born. My sister had come down from Toronto to visit with my parents, she left some time at a little after 9pm, but roughly seven-ish miles away from home, her car broke down. At least she broke down in front of a family friend's house, and they said she could use their phone. She called dad and he came down and picked her up. A friend said that she could just leave her car in the driveway until the next day. She decided to stay at our parents for the night and head out in the morning. As they're coming back, it's now a little after 10pm. While driving through a particularly wooded spot, they hear a loud inhuman scream. It was so loud it drowned out the radio, the engine, and even their voices for the split second that it happened. Dad slammed on the brakes and they started freaking out, when suddenly something appeared at the edge of the car's lights on the side of the road. It was a coyote, at least seven feet tall, and was walking on its hind legs, and had a black and white striped tail. It walked across the road in front of their car, then once again it disappeared across the road, when they heard the scream again, only far louder than the first time. Safe to say, they got the hell out of there quickly. I want to take you back to the mid 80s. My mother's mother had a 1979 Thunderbird, she had a white vinyl top, and the body was a light metallic red, and it had chrome all around. One afternoon about twilight, 
She has to go to someone's house, so she cranks her car up and she goes. We live in a rural backwards area. The neighbors are spaced out, and at the time power lines are spaced out, so it gets fairly dark quickly. And when it gets dark, it gets really dark. She comes up to a hill called Rock Hill. It's inclined about 80%. So anyone who was at the time playing football or wanted to get into shape would just ride a bicycle or run all the way around that hill, and it did a really good job of conditioning them. She makes it to the top part of our hill, where it's level, and all of a sudden her battery goes kaput, or maybe it's the starter. She gets out, checks it after she tries to crank it. And the battery cables are okay. Nothing really unusual, but she notices it is very, very quiet, as in too quiet. And she gets back in her car, locks the doors, and waits for someone to come by who can help her out. And she's sitting there waiting when she notices this shadow. At first, she just kind of brushes it off and says it's her imagination. But the shadow moves towards her, and the shadow goes in and looks into the driver's side door. And she gets a flashlight and shines on it, and sure enough, it's the whole stereotypical thing, except this one has fur with camel brown fur around its eyes, his palm and his belly, and he stands at about eight feet tall, because it looked about a foot taller than her second husband, who was around seven feet tall. This one was huge. On a personal level, I've met one of these. Cryptids before when I was going to work one morning, and driving around. It's winter time and the sun is kind of starting up late. Got my headlights on, and I come up to a place in the road that's got a really big curve, and I just see it standing on the road. It has charcoal grey fur, but his back and stomach have black fur, and it just very nonchalantly walks back into the woods. When I tell my wife, we agree it's kind of strange. And just go about our daily routine of life. A week after I saw this, I went up the road for exercise, and as I'm walking, I get this strong feeling like I'm being watched, and once again things are eerily quiet. So then, like this feeling of fear and dread overcomes me, and I just keep walking and I'm trying to stay calm. So as I'm walking, I'm hearing this beating on the trees, and I'm seeing stones getting thrown, not thrown around me. So I come to the end of the road, turn around, and go back to my house. I was at my girlfriend's house for the weekend, which is usually every Friday to Sunday, and in of itself isn't that unusual. We both recently started college. She still lives with her parents and two younger brothers. It was about 4:50 in the morning, and this is when the creepy stuff began. You see, everyone else in the house was asleep, except for us. We love staying up late to play video games or watch films. We just finished watching a movie, in fact, and were preparing to go to sleep. I was getting changed into shorts and a shirt to sleep, and my girlfriend went to the kitchen to get us both a glass of water. Since her room can get very hot and stuffy during the summer, after getting changed, I was chilling on the beanbag in her room, waiting for her to return. At this point, it's important to understand the basic layout of where she lives; otherwise, this next part might be slightly confusing. So her house is about eight minutes outside the city limits, and she has a long driveway that goes from the road up a hill that leads to her house. Her house is surrounded by trees and fairly dense forest, and her nearest neighbors are a good couple of minutes away. At the end of her driveway is a motion sensor that, when activated by movement, then makes three loud beeps inside her home. Her dad is a fairly high-ranking military man, so he definitely takes precautions and safety measures to ensure his family's safety. And like I said before. She was in the kitchen alone at around 4 a.m. while I am still in her bedroom. Her kitchen is down the hallway and through the living room from where her bedroom is, so she should be back within a minute or two. She was just taking at least triple the usual amount of time, 
and right before I was going to head into the kitchen to check on her, she walked around the corner with a worried look on her face. She can be spooked pretty easily, so I wasn't alarmed at first. She handed me the water and then started to explain quickly why she had taken so long. She'd pretty much said that she was in the kitchen in the sink filling up the water when she heard a whining sound coming outside the two windows near the sink. She figured it was one of her two dogs and decided to go to the garage to check on them. They were both curled up in their kennels when she opened the door, asleep, and had only just been woken up by her turning on the light to see them. She told me at that point she was pretty confused and slightly uneasy. She walked back into the kitchen and heard this really deep, weird bark coming again from somewhere outside the kitchen windows. And please note that it was 4am. So it's nearly pitch black outside, especially since the dense trees around their house block up plenty of moonlight. She told me she couldn't see anything and hurried back to the room to tell me. I was slightly skeptical at first, since I assumed it was just the dogs and that my girlfriend was really tired and tripping out. So I agreed to follow her back to the kitchen. At first I heard nothing for a good two minutes and decided to try and recreate what she had done. I walk in, turn on the sink and wait. Another two minutes go by and I hear the same freaky whining sound coming from outside the window. It sounded so much like a wounded animal. I had to turn on the lights on the garage again, which was slightly lighting up the area outside the window, but I couldn't see a sign of animals or anything. She switched off the light, and then we heard the whining sound grow further away, almost as if the creature had fled up the hill near the kitchen and towards the forest. That was when we realized that it was scared or sensitive to the lights, so we left the kitchen and returned to her room. At this point I was pretty spooked, and I wanted to make sure that whatever it was had been scared off for good. So we go back into the kitchen, and after a few minutes, both armed with decently sized knives that my girlfriend has in her room for protection. Five minutes go by in the kitchen, and it's silent. But then the whining starts up again, and a weird, sad, barking sound, like something imitating an injured animal was maybe 10 feet outside the kitchen windows. And at that moment, I realized something. There's no reason for some creature to try and imitate an injured animal sound unless it wanted to lure us out and cause us harm. I get slightly annoyed at it and start to yell at it to go away and everything falls silent. Then I hear movement outside the window and a weird sound, almost as if something was moving alongside the wall right under the window. Then, Whatever it was lets out this unnatural sound, almost like a groan and a growl. My girlfriend and I looked at each other and sprinted out the kitchen without a word. We hid in her room until we passed out at 5 or 6 a.m. We had talked it over, listened to a ton of animal noises, and not a single one got anywhere close to the final unnatural sound. I wouldn't even be able to accurately mimic the sound. It was so eerie and haunting, and I can still hear it in my head. So we did some research the next day, and there are a few known possibilities that we came up with. Perhaps a Wendigo, Skimwalker, I don't know, maybe even something else. We looked around outside in the morning, and there was no blood and no tracks, so definitely no injured animal. However, on the hill about 10 feet in front of the kitchen window, we saw two heavy indents on the ground, and then flattened grass leading up. We decided to tell one of my girlfriend's brothers about this experience so that he could help test something. We had one person go inside the kitchen sink near the windows and the other walk around in various places near the windows making sounds to try and triangulate where the creature had been standing. We concluded it was at one point no more than five feet from the windows and then at another point it fled up the hill, which matched with the trampled grass and indents leading up the hill. Farther up the hill, there's a path that branches and another part of the path is fairly abandoned and overgrown. Nobody has walked there in at least two years and I followed it to the end and kept going a little further looking for tracks. 
I did manage to find something interesting. A three foot tall fern and brambles almost completely flattened, and a few twigs snapped perfectly in half as if something decently large had walked through the area in a hurry, and it seemed very recent. We then decided to tell my girlfriend's parents about it, and her dad seemed especially interested in it. He told us that the wood panels on the pump house had been torn off within the last few days. He then took one of the dogs into the woods, and we assume he checked for any signs. He returned and about two days later installed a camera right next to the kitchen window where we heard the sounds. And again, he's a pretty high ranking military man, and he 100% believes that there was something going on that night. If anyone has any thoughts or input, I'd appreciate it. This is a story that happened to me 18 years ago, when I was seven years old, living on a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Both my parents worked in the mornings, and the school year had just ended, so I was home alone. From the kitchen window, I saw something strange in the trees, a creature of sorts. Two things I know now. One, this wasn't a little kid hallucination, and two, I know what it looked like. The creature was about the size of a small car and setting about 15 feet up in the tree. And it had the proportions similar to a gargoyle in both shape and posture. You know how gargoyles sit hunched over with their back legs wider and their front legs or arms closer together or touching minus the wings? No skin was shown. The creature had short bear-like fur mixed with owl feathers. The head was massive with the shape of a bear head and possibly a large beak. Many features of the face were strange and I fixated on the eyes of this beast. They were huge. The odd thing about them was that they were blurry looking, like a droopy oil painting. It was nearly summer morning, early enough to still be cool, but late enough to be clear lit everywhere. I saw the creature out the kitchen window ran out onto the front porch to get a better look at it. I wasn't about to go check it out as I was 50 yards away. So I went to grab my father's binoculars. And when I got back to the front porch, the creature was gone, nowhere to be seen. So me being a brave seven year old boy went out to inspect the area. I saw it, but upon arrival saw nothing, no broken branches or markings or anything. The one thing I remember about the area, was that it was dead silent. In a normal forest, it's always bursting with noise, but not now. There wasn't a single thing to be heard. And I mean that forest where I used to live was super loud too, with all sorts of animals making noise at all times of the day. I've never heard of any sort of cryptid that matches what I saw that day. And for 18 years, I have been insanely curious. If anyone could lead me in the right direction, of what folklore or creature or cryptid I saw that day, please let me know. I'd love to find out what it was I'm confident I saw that day. My family owns the farm in the heart of an Indian reservation. One winter, I was home from Christmas taking care of the farm while my parents were away Christmas shopping. As I was home by myself way late into the night, and I heard all of our cows freaking out. I knew it had to be wild dogs that are rampant in the area. So I throw on some boots, grab a shotgun and load it up and head out to the field. This was a perfect scenario for a horror movie. It was cloudy, but there was a full moon and it was breaking through the clouds, making it just right to light up all the snow. I ran out into the middle of the field and just in time to see two giant dogs. They were standing up facing each other and fighting. I think perfect two for one. So I pump a shell into the chamber of the MR12 and then it happened. The two dogs heard the rack. They both stopped, looked over at me and ran away on their hind legs. Immediately I froze and every ghost story about skinwalkers and all the other Native American legends I grew up with flew through my mind. Keep in mind I'm a white guy, 
and up until then these were just boogeyman stories that all the native kids liked to tell us to scare us. That night, they became real to me. I live in an apartment complex in western New York, about an hour from Lake Ontario. My complex has a laundromat and is surrounded on almost all sides by patches of forest and it's next to a river. I have a weird habit of doing laundry at night, but the laundry mat lights turn off at seven. So I usually bring a dollar store flashlight to stand upright on one of the machines as it lights up the entire room, but only the laundry room. One day in late December, I'm doing laundry at around 8.30 or nine, when I feel something almost a presence. So I turn around to see if another tenant is doing laundry, but nobody's there. Lo and behold, some emaciated looking face is staring at me through the window. My light doesn't reach the corner of the room, so I could only make out a few details like extreme emaciation, like a Holocaust victim extreme. Its eyes were sunken, it was pale. It looked like it hadn't seen the sun in years. I see it, and it skitters away on all fours into the forest towards the river. I'd normally assume it was some kind of crazy meth head because we have a couple of those, except for how it ran on all fours. People always seem unnatural when they do it, even with years of practice. To this thing, it seemed completely natural, like it was built to run that way. Ever since that night at the laundromat, whenever I go near those patches of forest, I feel like something's watching me. It's very uncomfortable, a predatory feeling, like I'm being hunted. But there are almost no predators in my area, certainly none that would threaten me. The worst we really have is coyotes, but they tend to stay out of my area. And a few weeks back, my lights have been acting funny. I'll have the lights be on and then it'll turn off and then back on again at random. Nothing wrong with the breakers, nothing wrong with the switch. I've had people look at the wiring and nobody can find any issue. I'm unsure if it's tied to what I saw that night, but it puts me on edge because now it's spread to outside lights too. Maybe it has something to do with our lovely highway of death that's killed around eight or nine people since 2012, which is also right next to the river. I'm not sure if that road or the river is connected to the critter, but I felt that it was worth mentioning. And I'd love to get your thoughts on the matter. Before I get to this story, I'd like to point out that I'm not from America, which is surprisingly in contrast of what people often think. I'm from the Netherlands and due to the kind of mentality I was raised with, I would have never even dared to think about the existence of supernatural creatures here. Personally, I've always been on the fence about these kind of things, unsure what stories are legends and just superstitions and which ones hold more truth than fantasy. The typical Dutch mentality I've been raised with is that there's nothing more to the world than what we've already discovered, at least not in terms of the divine, the paranormal and the supernatural. At least that's what I had originally thought. But as it often does, the world tends to show us her truths in one form or another. I was born in Holland, the Midwest of the country, but moved to Brabant, the Middle South at a young age. There's nothing out of the ordinary about my home, but I'm happy to say there's quite a big forest just a few kilometers south of where I live. I'd often and still do go on long walks and relaxing hikes there. I would often go off trail occasionally and go on nightly walks in the summer, all illegally, since here we have strict laws that say nobody is allowed to either camp, go off trail or be in the forest at night. Needless to say, I deliberately stayed in the forest until after sunset, secretly risking a fine. I'd often wear dark clothes to go out into the forest so that the service men and women and the late night lurkers would be unable to spot me. I don't know why I'm addicted to these hikes in the forest, especially the nocturnal ones. I've always felt a really strong call of the wild, 
since the first time I went off trail in the summer of 2017, when I'd visit the woods either going off trail or not. Not even the time of day would matter. I'd get energetic and excited about it. I would even dare to say that I wanted to go hunting at some point, when I'd see a deer or rabbit nearby. Unfortunately, I don't have a license or the weapons, so I'm pretty sure I wouldn't catch anything. Anyway, months ago at the start of autumn, I went for another night hike in the forest. I had to bring my flashlight since it was cloudy and rainy outside. As always, I went there on my mountain bike, chaining it to a pole before I'd set off into the darkness between the trees. I saw just the last people walking back to their cars and homes as I was walking in the opposite direction. It was getting completely dark when I reached the middle point of the forest. You can call me a hippie, I don't mind. Frankly, I would have done so myself if I'd read a similar story. Now before I get to the actual encounter, I must say that I have already encountered something similar in the woods of January of 2017. I went to the forest during the day since the winter's first snow had fallen during the night and I wanted to go and take some photographs of the beautiful snowy landscape. Though I stayed a bit too long, it had gotten dark, and I had to be back at my bike and out the woods. So hurrying back is when I heard a loud crunch coming from the bushes, as if something big, like a deer, was running along the trees. The sound was distant at first, but soon it got closer, until indeed I did see a deer, speed out of the snow, covered depths of the forest across the path I was on. Though, hot on its heels, raced something different. This huge, wolf-like creature, clearly bigger than a regular wolf. This one was at least a meter high at the shoulder. It looked slightly sturdier than a regular timber wolf, with dark, shaggy fur looking at its face. I could see its teeth, and its paws. They were much larger to that of a normal wolf. Now please note that back in 2017, wolves were only just returning to the Netherlands, mostly roaming the border with Germany, and eventually settling in our biggest national park, which was located more than 100 kilometers away from my place. Plus, there hadn't been any wolves spotted in this area yet, so it was pretty much impossible for me to believe this was just an ordinary wolf. Only looking at the sheer size of it already, I would have taken a picture of it, if only I could have. Everything happened so fast, I saw the deer and the wolf cross the trail within a time span of five seconds at most before they vanished into the dark. Still awestruck and a little unsettled by now, knowing there was a huge canine roaming the woods, I went over to look at possible tracks it might have left behind. It did, but with every gallop it must have kicked up lots of dirt in the air, since there were no paw prints, only claw marks, and then patches of dirt missing, though those marks were still as big as my hand with my fingers spread out. Feeling frightened and still processing that I'd just seen a gigantic wolf hunt down its prey, I marched over to my bike as fast as I could, unlocked it, jumped on it, and rode away, before it decided to change its mind and make me its meal instead. That's when I heard a sinister deep howl coming from the woods. Like a wolf's howl, but in some way deeper and more haunting. Of course, I didn't tell anyone what I'd seen, especially since I didn't have enough evidence to support my claim. But I wasn't afraid of going back to the woods, not even at night, since I knew wolves generally aren't afraid of humans. And when I did go back, by the time of my second encounter, I'd almost forgotten about the beast that calls the forest its home. The summer of 2019, I returned for a nightly walk after having done the occasional hikes during the day. I didn't bring my camera with me this time, I just wanted to go for a refreshing full moon walk. After about half hour of walking deep into the woods, and after having set myself down on a wooden bench, I heard the faint bleating of a sheep from about 300 meters away. I stood up and started to go in the direction of the noise, mostly because the bleating sounded rather distressed, as if the sheep were panicking or trying to flee from something. I was already surprised that I could hear it from so far away, but what surprised me more was that I was able to smell something metallic as well. It was like a coppery scent 
very strong, and that's when I figured it must be the smell of blood. The wind was blowing in my direction, but still I didn't know I was capable of this. The flock was placed on a small moor about 300 meters from where I was seated on the bench. It took me some time walking towards the pen before I could see the sheep, as they were hidden by trees and bushes. When I arrived at the pen, something unexpected shocked me. Not only were the animals running around frantically and trying to escape, but there had been two sheep slaughtered lying there in a puddle of blood, their throats torn open by powerful jaws and ferocious claws. Judging from the looks of the deep gashes in the skin and bite marks on their neck, there were a scramble of enormous lupine paw prints around the sheep's corpses and around their makeshift enclosure. It seemed as if the killer was meticulous about choosing its prey before stepping inside to make a move. After the victims had been selected, the results were clear to see. This monstrous beast threw caution to the wind, just as it had done to the sheep's innards. To most, it was a horrendous sight, but I found it more curious than anything else. The first thing I felt was frustration, that something was roaming around the woods near my home. I followed the tracks, hoping to find what made them before whatever it was found me. As I got deeper into the woods, the foliage became denser and harder to navigate. It was just that dark. Thinking quickly, I turned on my flashlight and shone it around the shadows cast by the moonlight, creating eerie shapes and figures. Suddenly, I heard muffled footsteps from around me. A branch snapped from behind me, and without thinking, I shone my light towards where I'd heard it. Dark yellow eyes about four feet above the ground reflected back at me from the shadows. As soon as the beast had stepped out from the cover of the shadows, and when I came face to face with it, I froze. It was, from a few quick looks of it, the same animal I'd seen two and a half years ago. It had the same build, the same dark shaggy fur. The animal appeared to be staring at me cautiously, its gaze hard and cold, but it didn't seem to be aggressive. From the blood on its snout, I could tell that this must have been the beast that killed those sheep. And now I was indeed scared, on the edge and cautious. It's not like I stood much of a chance against a wolf like this, with its huge teeth and claws, but my instincts told me to fight rather than flee if need be. After all, if I ran, I'd pretty much give myself away as prey for the animal if it was still hungry. Plus, these woods were mine, and the beast was an intruder, and I'd be damned if I let an intruder trespass on my home. The beast was still watching me, and as it did so, it rose onto its hind legs. Thankfully, no signs of aggression were visible. Despite that, I took a defensive stance, broadening my shoulders and appearing as big as I possibly could. The creature approached. It was now standing about five meters away, and I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand as it bowed forward a little, sniffing the air. It then perked up its ears, twitched them about, as if it was reconsidering going after me. And despite how standoffish I chose to appear, and how I may act in my day-to-day -day life. I couldn't even come close to how intimidating and well-built this thing was, how large it was, and when compared to, well, how minuscule I am, I shrank inside. The wolf stepped back, breaking eye contact as it sniffed the air and looked around. I took a tiny step forward, attempting to scare it off, as I once again tried to look as defensive and territorial as I felt in that moment. I decided to take my chances. It was now or never, so breathing in deeply and with my most intimidating voice, I shouted, Get out now. In Dutch, of course. The beast acted surprised, startled even, as if it hadn't even expected me to speak or be this defensive. It then let out a growl, and after that it got down on all fours and vanished into the foliage. Soon as I could no longer see or hear it, I let out a sigh of relief so loud that I was still afraid. That thing could hear me, and worse, it could return. 
My feet had gone numb as the adrenaline left my body, and I was quaking as the cold air finally started to nip at me. A loud, distant howl echoed from behind me, and as it rang through the night, the fear grew inside me. It howled again, and I started to head back to my bike, swiftly jogging for what seemed like hours, continuously checking every sound I heard, keeping my eyes wide open, like a startled deer, and never failing to look around me in case the monster had other plans. After making it back to my bike, I quickly unlocked it and raced home, breaking what must have been the world's record for fastest speed pedaled. And once I arrived, the realization hit me that I had very likely been staring death in the face. It made yet another cold shiver go down my spine. To relax, I had a drink, sat down on the couch, and as I sat down with a drink in hand, staring into the fireplace, the question started pouring at me. Why didn't it attack me? Why did it leave? Stranger still, how is something that big? Not to mention how it hasn't been reported in the local news. How has no one caught it on camera? And if they have, were they silenced by the media? Were they laughed at, mocked, ostracized? I had all these questions, but no way of finding any answers. Moreover, was it even what I thought it was? Was the creature perhaps a dire wolf of some kind? It was only thought to have gone extinct in prehistoric times. There had to be a logical explanation after all. Time moved on, weeks became months, and I never told a soul about my encounter. Since then, cattle mutilations have been reported. Strange and large animal tracks have been documented. People say it's a bear or a ravenous pack of wolves. But these stories only come up the night after a full moon, they say. There have even been multiple reportings of sheep massacres around the south and east of the country that have been confirmed to have been committed by a wolf. I've been back to these woods since, but only in the day. But even then, I still felt off, like I was being watched and unwelcome. My two encounters did make me dive into Dutch and European folk tales and legends about werewolves. And to summarize what I found, European timber wolves are said to have been the most bold and aggressive in the world. All I can say for certain is that no matter how unbelievable it sounds, always give a little bit of trust towards the old stories you're told, because you may just be encountering something straight out of fantasy, only to leave your survival, your life to fate. And if you should ever find yourself in the Netherlands, especially in the woods on a full moon at light, you best hope that thing you hear howling off in the distance is a lot further than you think to be, because there's no telling what might happen if the two of you meet. Good luck and have a good night. I've got a cousin down in Mississippi. He's a combat medic for the Mississippi National Guard. And he said he saw something out in the woods on a training op. A kind of mini war games type deal. But what he described seriously impacted me. Let's see what you make of it. There were two war platoons per company and two companies per team. Camp A, his camp, set up northwest of Yellow Creek and the enemy set up just south of a farm off Waynesboro, Shibuta, which is east of Waller's Ridge Road. So the exercise starts at midnight, and his platoon commander decides he may as well send out a group recon to scout a good ambush position, or at the very least, figure out what the enemy was up to. So my cousin's squad sets off north following some dirt trails, but keeping just off to the side in case they run into an enemy patrol. So, by about 2.30, they're about 500 meters out of the enemy's camp, slinking around a marsh, which puts them in clear sight through a power line, cut out through the woods. So the marksman pulls out his binoculars to check if the way is clear, and upon glancing just goes plain white and freezes. A few seconds later, the sergeant pulls his sorry ass back to the tree line and asks him, what the hell were you thinking? And the marksman, clearly about to crap himself, stammers something. Huh, 
There's something down the line. It ain't human. It ain't human. Everyone stood there in shock for a few seconds before some of the others decide to check for themselves. What they saw was described to me as a seven or eight foot tall furry thing. It's as if you took a coyote and put it on a stretching rack with matted white or gray fur with what looked like dried blood all over its chest. Its hind legs were 11 kinds of messed up, incredibly long and slender with knees backwards. The thing was just standing out in the open, sniffing around as if it were trying to track something. So the sergeant radios the sighting into company HQ and gets back. Get the hell out of there. Keep your heads down and keep off the roads. Get some live rounds and weapons free. The game is off. So his squad gets the hell out and the marksman, who at this point has finished having his panic attack, checks again. This time with his scope, rather than binoculars and the squad hurries back to Company HQ. When they get there, the sight is something to behold. Mounted patrol vehicles storming around the camp, spotlights scanning the tree line, comms going crazy with people seeing stuff in the woods, and another platoon had to be called to secure the area. There were no training exercises for the rest of the month, and an official order had to, and I quote, keep quiet and not tell anyone, not even family, had been put in order which needless to say my cousin promptly ignored. To this day, he was sure it was a skinwalker. I was about 15 or 16, walking home from a friend's place at about two or three o'clock in the morning with the friend I was living with at the time. My mate was pushing a BMX and we were just talking and laughing as we walked home. All of a sudden, we saw what looked like two very large greyhounds jump over a set of mailboxes at some flats and landed in the middle of the road. The mailboxes appeared to be one and a half meters tall and about five to six meters from the road. At that moment, I thought it was a little strange, but kept watching them. What I witnessed was something I will never forget in all my life. The two greyhounds, as they ran down the road, they appeared to both stand up on their hind legs and morph into a much bigger, much beefier being, which I can only describe as looking like a Yowie, which I guess is the equivalent to a Sasquatch to our friends from America and other countries. These Yowies both ran around the corner about 200 meters in the direction we came, and we both sat there dumbfounded. A few seconds later, we heard what sounded like a small female child scream in terror. Keep in mind it was around 3 a.m. in the morning and there were no children out. We both looked at each other in horror without saying a word and I jumped on the handlebars of the bike and he pedaled away, non-stop, all the way home about two kilometers away. When we got home, we locked the doors as we had no idea what we just saw. I asked him to describe what he had seen to me, and I was in disbelief as he explained the exact same thing I witnessed. That is probably the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. I've only told a few people about it, and I don't think a single person has believed me. They all say, drugs, alcohol, blah blah blah, but how can two people have seen the exact same thing at the exact same time, and it not be true? To start off, I live on the East Coast in Central Virginia, and the property I live on contains 10 acres of fields and woods. Just as some background info, the property was once a battleground during the Civil War. The Battle of Matadequin took place right around where I live. My friends and I have always seen ghosts and paranormal activity around the property whenever we hang out or camp, but this isn't why I'm sharing this. I should probably mention that our campsite contains tarp roofs with pallets set up as walls. I should also mention that we always carry firearms with us in the woods, but I'm always enforceful about making sure no one has any bullets chambered in their weapons, unless they have a reason to shoot. Well, one night in late April, three friends and I were hanging out by the fire within our campsite. At around quarter to midnight, one of my buddies and I 
wandered down the trail with no flashlight of any sort in the dark. We stopped at an opening by the field where we could see the stars and chatted about random topics for five to 10 minutes until we start hearing steps and twigs snapping in multiple areas in front of us. We are skeptical, but keep an ear out. All of a sudden, I yell out loud, which is very uncharacteristic for me as I rack a bullet in the chamber of my rifle as quickly as I can and aim it towards what I'm seeing. It was dark and I couldn't distinguish the details very well, but what I think I saw was pale, crawling uphill from another trail. It didn't seem intimidated though, rather intently curious. Its body moved similar to how a chicken bobs its head, but more subtle. My friend and I yelled to our other two friends to come and assist us as the creature got closer. We yelled loudly, but weren't scared, simply frightened and in awe. The creature went behind a tree and repeatedly poked its head out of the back. It occasionally began to crawl towards us from behind the tree, but would retreat once again. All its movements were slow and agile. After about two minutes, it vanished and we couldn't see it because of the brush. It probably fled into the woods. Our other two friends arrived a minute or so after the creature had fled. Their excuse was that they thought we'd run into a hunter or someone, so they decided to take the bullets out of their weapons. The next day, we went back to the spot of the sighting and found disturbed leaves and tracks exactly where we saw the creature. The friend I was with during the sighting is an extremely skilled tracker. We followed the tracks that led towards and off the property until it seemed to go cold or we lost them. We did find a small sized goat skull in the woods with no carcass to follow near the sighting area. Does anyone know what this could possibly be? The closest thing it resembles is the rape creature, in my opinion. My grandpa lived in Mighton, Utah, and he told stories about skinwalkers and how they could take the form of any animal or anyone you knew. I asked him one day, did you ever meet one? Yes, he replied solemnly. A long time ago before you were ever born, before your mother was born, it was when I was young and foolish. I went to the valley of the skinwalkers. It's a valley where life never enters, not even the crows, the very guardians of death will not go there. They too fear the evil that lives there. He continued with his story. I went out there to show people that nothing evil existed in the valley, nothing but their fears, but I was wrong. He went on that he had gone to the Skimwalker Valley in his old red Ford truck to prove to everyone that they were what he thought they were, just stories used to scare people. But when he reached the valley, the grass was black, as if it had been burnt and survived the fire. The trees looked dead, but were still alive. And he told me he saw a house not far from where he stood. It was old and the roof was caved in. The door was gone and he walked towards it. There were strange markings on the side of the house. Animal skeletons were thrown about the property and it was as if it were a sacred burial ground. Then he heard his grandmother. She had died long ago, but he heard her voice. The spirits were calling for him, for his life, for his skin, and for his blood. They were the lost souls that could change forms from man to beast. They chased him, scared him, and told him that they would never forget him. Whenever I visited my grandpa, he would show me something that was brand new, but was broken the next day. These spirits would kill his animals, so he finally stopped keeping his dogs outside. He got to the point where I snapped at him, telling him the stories were lies. I told him, prove it. He turned around and pulled up his shirt. His back was full of claw marks, torn wide open, scars from eons ago. I was scared and started to cry. She told my grandpa to put his shirt down, but he just stared out at the field across the road. She finally gave up and carried me inside. But as I looked over my mother's shoulder, I saw a large black dog 
yonder with white eyes, watching Grandpa, as if it were watching him, waiting for it to attack. But it never did. My Grandpa died two months later. The doctor said his heart gave out, but I knew what really ended him. That was 42 years ago. No one has believed me, but it's true. So I will tell you, never look into a skinwalker's eyes. It won't forget you. If you do, sooner or later it will have you. You can fight and refuse, but if that's the case, then I hope you're not afraid to die. A few friends and myself were hanging out at my house bored one night and started telling stories about things we've seen or felt to scare each other. My girlfriend at the time had lived in the area a little longer than most of us and started telling us about an abandoned mental hospital that was only about a half hour from my house. She told us that somewhere on its grounds were entrances to underground tunnels and rooms that kept some of the buildings and some of the sidewalks warm. We decided to go out there and look around for ourselves. And after roaming the halls for a while, we came across the steps. Once we got into the basement, we found one of the tunnels. So I walked over to shine my flashlight down the hall to see where it went. The hall was long enough to where I couldn't see the end. It just went on, it was pitch black. I couldn't see any doorway or even a tunnel that crossed paths with this one. But as I'm looking down the tunnel, I see this figure kind of slide halfway out of the doorframe I didn't see before. It's sitting with his knees up to its chin with both arms resting over its knees overlapping each other. It was skinny, like leather over bone, and very pale. Its eyes were like the size of softballs and they were glowing in this weird bluish yellow white color. At this point, I'm sort of crouched down staring back at this thing. I can even think straight to get myself to move away from the hall. And then it spoke to me, not outright, almost like it was in my head. I'll never forget what it said. Come on, come on down here and see what we have. Come on over, come on. I stood up and didn't want to take a step. Every muscle in my body wanted to turn around and leave, but I couldn't. As soon as I took that first step, I felt something grab my arm and I heard a very different voice say in my head, run. I turned and ran. I left my friends down there, but I ran all the way back through the hospital to my friend's car. They caught up with us and we raced out of the place and we didn't stop once until we got back to town and found a white castle. We found handprints on the back bumper and his rear window. Needless to say, I've never gone back to that place. I don't even like talking about it. A friend of mine wanted me to share this with you fine people to see what you guys thought of it and ask for anyone with knowledge on what it could have been. Feel free to message me and finally let me know what the hell you think it was. So I live in a somewhat medium sized town with a mix of cities and backwards areas. A bus stop I usually use is a good mix. It has buildings close by while also having entryways into the nearby surrounding woods. One morning I was waiting for the bus when I realized it was late that morning. I got annoyed and decided since I was bored, I would go into this little walkway slash trail that was nearby, not all the way, just enough to where I could be secluded by the trees. After a while of checking my phone, I heard the bus stop at the stop a little way down from mine. I headed back to the stop, so I got there and got a fight or flight response that was very intense, almost as if a firearm had been shot off. I turn around to see this crouching creature coming out of the secluded area I was just in. It's pitch dark. Its arms were about the size of half its body. Its head looked like an unused eraser and the most terrifying part of it was its size. It was easily the size of a telephone or lamp pole. It towered over me and everything around it. Its hands were large and its fingers were thick. 
and were about the size of half my arm. I didn't know if I should run because I knew this thing could catch me in a few strides. Some time passed while it climbed out the walkway and stood looking at me. Then the bus pulled up and opened its doors. I looked at the bus and back at the creature but it was gone. Vanished. I looked at the bus driver and his face was normal. I assumed he hadn't actually seen anything. I got on the bus and silently cried for a few minutes. I don't know if this is correlated or not, or if it's just my brain, but that night I had a dream where the exact same thing happened except the bus didn't show up, and that thing tore me to pieces. My friend called it the line man, but I don't care about naming it. I went back to the bus stop over the course of the next few weeks, and every time I do, I always check to see if it's there. And it happened again. Once while walking back from church, in a side facing the mountain, I got the same fight or flight response and I stood still. And then I looked to my left, where the thing's giant hand was sitting. It noticed me, so it moved out of the brush towards me. But I ran, and I saw it stand, and it was easily as tall as the church. I ran around, got my car, and drove off. I then contemplated what would have happened to me had I not run. The other story is from last night. I was trying to sleep, but I kept on waking up because my heart would beat intensely, giving me an adrenaline rush. Not only that, but I heard banging vibrations and twigs snapping from the back of my property. I got up and looked out my window when I saw something that kept me up for the rest of the night. On my roommate's car was a muddy slash rainy handprint bigger than my torso. That morning I got up and went to the bus stop and saw two more things that have stuck with me since. I saw a giant footprint easily about the size of half my body. I also saw my neighbor wailing over the fact that the apparent storm had ripped one of her trees out the ground. But I don't think this was the storm. This isn't fiction and I actually don't know what to do. This is my mother's story, and she allowed me to share it. I'll be telling it from her perspective. We live in the desert, and things are always weird. So I was watching Netflix while laying in bed, and heard the chime of the security camera app notification. Now I had the app set that only the front door would give loud alerts, at this time of night. But all the cameras were recording, just not providing alerts. This made me curious as to what is out there this late, and I sat and checked the recording. I saw a large coyote pacing in and out of the front door patio space, which is not very large and sort of enclosed. I thought that it was kind of odd since it didn't really look like the coyote was hunting anything and there's nothing in that area to pique the coyote's interest. So I started heading to the front door. I got to the door and looked through the peephole to see if I could see any animals that it might be hunting for, and what I saw stole my breath. I saw what was the back of a bald head in the peephole. It stood for about a minute, not moving nor breathing, and this bald head never moved either. Let me be clear. This looked like a man standing very close to the door with his back turned to it. Finally, I ran to the dining room to get a clear view of who was standing there. But when I got there, no one was there. And when I went back to the peephole again to check, nothing was there anymore. Now, there's no way anyone could walk in any direction without alerting one of the cameras around my home. So I checked the recordings. After the coyote, there was nothing. This freaked me the hell out as the cameras are set to record motion and clearly caught the coyote, but never showed anyone walking up or leaving. If anyone has an explanation that gives me peace of mind, I'd appreciate it. My immediate thought, Skinwalker. I was 22 when this happened, two years ago. My name's Grisha. And for the past five or six years, I've only had two friends who have stuck around with me through thick and thin. We live within five minutes of each other in a rural area in Southwest Ohio, specifically in the hills of the Ohio River Valley. My friends 
are called Garrett and Oscar, and my brother, who is part of our friend group, is called Chris. Garrett and Oscar are actually next door neighbors. They both live on decently sized plots of land that they don't actually own. There's lots of farmland and thick forest, and behind Garrett's house are a few small ponds that we used to fish in. His house was pretty small and not in the best condition, and Oscar lived in a medium sized brick house. We would usually go to Oscar's place to hang out during summer, since his parents were always at camp, and Garrett's house or my house during the other seasons. This is somewhat relevant, but mostly for setup. Like I said, this happened about two years ago. Now, one thing you need to know about us is that we are firearm enthusiasts. So when one of my buddies called me and told me he brought a new rifle, I knew we were gonna go shooting before the day was over. I grabbed my own firearms, as did Chris. We jumped in the Jeep and drove over to Oscar's house. It was still early, about three in the afternoon. And less than five minutes after we'd pulled in, a black Chevy Impala pulled into the driveway, heralding Garrett's arrival. He bought his rifle and pistol as well. We shot for a few hours, taking pot shots at wooden targets Oscar had built in his backyard, and we'd burnt through a pretty large chunk of ammo. I decided I wanted to get something to drink, so I jumped in the Jeep and drove for about 10 minutes to the closest gas station. After getting to the gas station and grabbing a few cans of the Nectar of the Gods, by which of course I mean Monster, I headed back to my friend's house. When I came back, I saw all three of them standing by the door at the side of the house. Oscar had a very uneasy look on his face. We jumped out the Jeep and walked over and asked him what was going on. We heard some weird stuff in the woods a few minutes ago, Garrett told me. I asked him what he was talking about and what he meant by weird stuff. They began to explain that they heard some sort of loud vocalization that sounded between a coyote's yelping and a howl. None of us had any idea what it could have been, so we opted to forget about it. We went inside and decided to play some games, and after a few hours I became bored and started browsing 4chan on my phone and lost track of time. It was getting late, Garrett had walked outside to smoke a cigarette. Oscar was in the toilet, and Chris's girlfriend came and collected him. Oscar's dog started to bark all of a sudden, and it startled me. I heard Garrett coming back inside the house rather quickly and asked him what was going on, and if something was wrong. Step outside and check for yourself, he told me. I came out curious about what the dogs were barking at, and the second I opened the door, the smell hit me. It was the worst smell I'd ever smelt in my life. Imagine the smell of a wet dog, the smell of a dead deer rotting in the sun, and the smell of landfill, combined. That's the best way I can describe it. Repulsed by the stench, I went back inside and told Garrett I can see why he came in so quickly. The dogs were barking, and they appeared to be getting more aggressive. When Oscar finally came out the bathroom, wondering what the commotion was about, Garrett explained the smell, and Oscar seemed more curious than anything. He was also angry, thinking someone was trespassing. He grabbed his firearms and walked out to look around. He told us to stay inside until he returned. Not thinking much of it, we agreed and I began browsing 4chan. I was startled when I heard the sound of a dog yelp, followed by five shots in rapid succession. A few minutes later, Oscar burst through the door, instructed us to grab our own firearms, and that there's some tall dude in a ghillie suit that just ended the life of one of his dogs. We grabbed our firearms and followed him outside, staying close the entire time. Sure enough, in the backyard, we found one of his dogs. The throat was ripped. This wasn't a small dog either, it was a large poodle mix of some kind, one of the really big ones. Close by, we saw the other dog cowering in his house. The cows in the pasture on the other side of the road were mooing as if they were both afraid and agitated. And I asked Oscar to explain what was going on. And he told me that on the other side of the barn, where he heard the dog yelp, he rounded the corner and saw a figure that looked like a big guy in a ghillie suit running towards the woods. He shot at him hoping to hit his leg and incapacitate him, but he knew he didn't. 
the same smell he described earlier, was hanging in the air. But it was faint. Garrett and Oscar had flashlights on their rifles, and I had one on my pistol, so I slung my rifle over my back, drew my pistol, and we fanned out to search the area. I wasn't expecting to find anything. I could see Garrett heading to the other edge of the property, and Oscar was moving towards the cow pasture. I headed back towards the barn, and as I started to step in, I lit a cigarette, when I felt raindrops hit me. I stepped into the barn to smoke, stood there for under a minute when I heard another shot coming from the direction Garrett went. I started going that way and saw Oscar heading there too. While we were making our way, Garrett fired three more shots. What are you shooting at? I asked. I saw the dude, but... Oscar's voice was shaky and hushed. It didn't look like a guy. Garrett took a heavy gulp and continued to explain. It looked like a big dog or a wolf. I could clearly see its muzzle and ears and I saw it standing behind some bushes, but it was on its hind legs. He stopped, pulled out a cigarette, hands quivering, but still managed to light it. I reckon it must have been about six feet tall, he went on to say. What are you even talking about? You know there aren't any wolves around here and coyotes aren't that big. You think a coyote would have had the guts to come up and rip my dog's throat? We've got to be dealing with some pelt-wearing hermit strung out our net or something. My friend went on to explain he sized up the height by taking reference to a nearby tree that was about 350-ish feet away. So we all walked over to see what he was talking about and then the rain started to pick up and the wind was getting strong as well. The clap of thunder put us all on edge and sure enough, once we reached the tree, which was a large maple, the branch he used to determine the size was close to eight feet off the ground by our estimate. We decided to put the other dog in the garage and keep it safe from whoever or whatever was messing with us. The dog was inside a small kennel, but if you live in a rural area, you know that junkies always manage to find their way to break into places they shouldn't be. We all went back to the house, locked the dog in, and stayed there. Should we just leave? We can just crash at Grisha's house until morning, Garrett said. I reminded him that Chris and his girlfriend were there, and his face instantly turned to one of disgust. We all hated Chris's girlfriend because she was really annoying and none of us wanted to deal with her. So we unanimously decided to hunker down with our weapons and stay awake on shifts. It was past midnight at this point and I volunteered to take first shift until around 2 a.m. while the other two lads passed out. I sat there watching the window and became bored after the adrenaline wore off. I reached into my backpack and pulled out a finely crafted Gurkha cigar and stepped out on the back porch, lit it and began to unwind. I stood there for about 10 minutes when I heard the cows begin to make more noise and I could hear the other dog barking aggressively inside the garage. I became on edge again and sat my cigar in the ashtray and unslung my rifle and held it on with the safety off. I made sure not to stray too far from the porch light, but I got far enough into the field to see movement in the tree line. I couldn't see what it was, but in a gap in the trees and undergrowth, I saw quick flashes of a gray figure. I began feeling uneasy. So I started backing to the house. I could hear rustling over the breeze. It sounded like it was moving towards me and I pointed my rifle in that direction. I had 10 shots to defend myself before I would reach for my pistol if something were happening. The rustling stopped. I still couldn't see anything. I was around halfway between the porch and the tree line and time just felt like it stopped. I felt like I was standing there for hours. I turned and ran, hearing something burst out of the undergrowth behind me. I reached the back door, threw it open, struggling to catch my breath due to years of smoking. Garrett and Oscar had woken up. Garrett's shift started soon, and I told them about what happened, and they told me to go lie down for a bit. When I woke up, we would all sit up until sunrise. I lay down on the couch and managed to somehow doze off, and was awoken not long after by Garrett shaking me. We've got to go now, he said in a panicked tone. 
Oscar went outside half hour ago and he still isn't back yet. I was still half asleep, so it took a moment to sink in. Oscar's gone? I asked, trying to make sense of what I was hearing. I sat up and asked him to explain. We heard the cows outside acting annoyed, but then they started to sound like they were scared and some of them managed to trample through the fence. Oscar went to see what scared them and told me that if he wasn't back in tent to call the cops. By now I was lacing my boots up. Forget that, I said. Oscar's a brother. We can't just leave him out there. We're going to go find him. I agreed without hesitation. We grabbed all our arsenal and headed out, locked the door behind us, and I could see the spot in the fence where the cows had broken through. We crossed the road and walked into the pasture. This pasture is huge. Part of it is just grass, but it also has small ponds, but most of it is a forest. Flat forest. The kind with not much undergrowth and where the trees are spaced out more. A great place for cattle and a great place to hunt too. If I had to guess, I would say at least 200 acres. Barrett used to hunt on this farmer's land too. He was leading the way when we heard a long string of rapid fire, followed by a short pause, followed by nine more shots. It was clearly Oscar emptying out his arm, grabbing his pistol and emptying it out too. We ran in that direction, even though it sounded far away. And we reached the wooded part of the property and called Oscar's name. We kept making our way to the direction we heard the shots and panic began to set in with each passing moment. Garrett was losing his call and I wasn't far behind. He suddenly fired off a shot and began sprinting. There he is, that's gotta be him, he was yelling. I gave chase, but was having trouble keeping up. Slow down, I yelled, trying to get him to listen. We need to stick together. But he didn't listen. His light was bobbing back and forth as he ran and I continued to follow. I slipped in a pile of mud and got it all in my mouth. I looked up just as I was regaining my bearings. When I looked up, I saw a silhouette standing 50 feet away. It looked like a large German shepherd on its back legs. Its ears were pointing up and its muzzle. It looked like it was pointing in a different direction. I looked down and saw it didn't have front legs, but what looked like arms with hands and fingers tipped with claws. It seemed to be covered in gray matted fur, but what stood out the most were its piercing yellow eyes. I saw it run off in the direction Garrett was going, so I quickly stood up and gave chase. If Garrett was in danger, I had to do something and I ran and I started to hear gunshots and eventually saw Garrett's light in the distance. He stopped shooting and I saw the light point at the ground like he was reloading. I caught up and asked him if he saw it. He looked over and noticed Oscar on the ground, his back against a tree and asked if he was okay. He's just unconscious, he replied. We gotta take him home. We both picked him up, slung an arm around our shoulders and made our way back to the house. We felt, we knew, should I say, we were being watched. We could hear movement when we moved and it stopped when we stopped. I drew my pistol with my free hand and switched on the light attached to it. My eyes stung as sweat made its way inside. Garrett and I were both out of breath and we still had quite a long way to go. After walking for about 20 minutes, Oscar awoke. We stopped to ask him what happened and he started to explain things to me, but was cut off by the sound of a branch snapping. Garrett and I both trained our lights in that direction and saw the now familiar flash of gray just at the edge of the light. I turned in that direction and fired three shots. We heard a growl and the sound of something big running away and we then booked it. If I had kept track of time, and the direction as well. We should have broken out of the tree line in 10 minutes and then see the light from the house. Fortunately, I was right. We ran through the pasture, made it to the fence, crossed the street, and I asked Oscar to unlock the door. He couldn't find the keys. So we tried the window. We went to the back of the house and managed to remove the AC from a window, which Oscar then climbed through. He let us in and the rest of the night was uneventful. The next day, we talked to the owner of the pasture. 
he found three of his cows dead and partially eaten. He also found a trail of blood into the wooded area that led towards the house, and then the opposite direction to the edge of his property. He also found Oscar's keys on the ground where he'd been knocked out, and where we found him. The farmer explained the blood trail led to the land owned by an old hermit who lives in a trailer in the woods. He apparently never leaves and has relatives bring him food, and is rumoured to have messed with the occult in his younger days. We told the farmer everything, but he didn't believe us, thinking we saw a pack of rabid coyotes or feral dogs. So, what could it have been? Was it a wolf-like cryptid? A werewolf? A dogman? My friend still lives in the same house, and he hasn't seen or heard anything since. This happened last night. I'm currently in Arizona. The full moon was up. Now, if you live like in a city or somewhere in a forest, you probably don't know how bright a full moon can actually be. For some reason, I've gotten really into mapping. Me and my little cousin made one big crudely constructed map of the desert surrounding our campground, and we wanted to explore more in the night. So when darkness set upon the desert, we ventured out in the dark. My grandpa made this super cool wooden sword for me. It had spikes all around it, and would hurt really badly if you were to be hit by it. I guess that if some crazy person or a coyote came near us, it could either scare them off, or beat it away. We moved around half a mile from camp, and came to the wash. For anyone who doesn't know, when it rains, yes, it rains in the desert, water could flow and create rivers. When the water is gone, the empty rivers are still there. These are called washes, and some can be huge. Some could be a few feet wide. This one was a few hundred feet wide. We were walking down to the wash, being able to see everything and having a spiked club, we weren't really scared of anything. We went to see the dead, skeletal body of a falcon, which we dubbed Anakin, after the Jedi who was cut to pieces by his master, and then returned to the wash, being careful around the shadows in case anything were hiding in them. After about 20 minutes of exploring, we came to a part of the wash where these walls curved in by a few feet. This change was barely noticeable and the wash was still huge. However, as we were about to enter this small spot, I got a terrifying feeling in my stomach. I wanted to run, to ditch my cousin, and get away from there. Instead, I grabbed his arm and told him we should go back. He turned around and I walked back to camp, the whole time blabbering about a custom Smash character. I followed him and I got that feeling again, but around five times stronger, when I stopped walking and turned around. Standing where the wall curved in was what appeared to be a man, but he was huge, at least seven feet tall. It looked naked in the light, but I didn't see anything in between his legs. The legs of the creature were bent backwards under the knee, like a wolf or dogs. Said leg was small, and the monster's arms were longer than I was couldn't see its face, and I highly doubt I wanted to. If the thing stood on its back's legs, it would have been maybe 10 to 14 feet tall. It didn't attack though. All it did was crawl back up the wash wall and into the bushes. The crawling was perfect, and the knees didn't even touch the ground. It wasn't like a baby crawl. It was more like the girl from the ring crawl. The moment it disappeared into the bushes, I ran, grabbed my cousin's arm and dragged him all the way back to the campsite. I have no doubt in my mind that if I had gone any further, I might have been dead. I don't think my pathetic wooden club would have done anything to that. I've told my family that I saw a coyote and that I was freaked out by it. They wouldn't believe me if I told them. I don't want to leave the trailer now. I don't want to go outside at all. But I do want to know if anyone has seen anything like this in Arizona. That thing is still out there. And I need to know what it is. My mum and I were driving home after having dinner at our new property 
with friends and family. My aunt is in the front with us, and we're following her home. She's doing the same since we live pretty close together, and we reach a bend, and my aunt slows down and her lights shine on a dog. I immediately recognize it as a dog, and my mum goes, ah, oh, look, it's cute. But it's taller than the average dog, and very wide, and not in an overfed way. Its hair is very long and matted, some pieces reaching the floor and it's jet black. Its face is huge, smiling with yellow eyes and the mouth ajar. I tell her before she finishes her sentence that it's not a dog, about three times in a row. She goes, yes it, then realizes it's not. Before she could tell me it was a dog, it stared at her right in the eyes, windows tinted up and all. She felt the same chill as I did when I originally saw it. After glancing at it at first, I no longer looked at it directly because I knew they hear what you think. Its gait was as if it were a human on all fours. It was extremely disproportionate and large. I've never seen fur that long in a dog. It looked as if the pelt was thrown on and hanging loosely. We get home and my aunt says she didn't even see it. We assumed she slowed down to look at it since my mum and aunt are very big animal lovers and are affectionate. We get inside and my aunt drives home. We discuss it and she agrees it was not a dog. I've experienced the same thing a few times before, but I believe once you know, you can always recognize them. My mum and I were driving home after having dinner slash lunch at our new property with our friends. My aunt is in front of us and we're following her home as she's doing the same thing to us since we live pretty close together. We reach a bend and my aunt slows down and her lights shine on a dog. Immediately, my mum recognizes it and says, "Ah, oh, look at the cute dog. It's taller than the average dog and very wide, but not in an overfed way. Its hair is very long and matted, some pieces reaching the floor and jet black. Its face is huge and smiling with yellow eyes, mouth ajar. I tell her before she finishes her sentence that it's not a dog, about three times in a row. She responds with, yes, it, it, oh my god, it isn't. Before she could tell me it was a dog, it stared her right in the eye. Windows, tinted knob. She feels the same chill as I did when I originally saw it. After glancing at it, I no longer looked at it directly, because I know they hear what you think. Its gait was as if a human was on all fours, extremely disproportionate and large. I've never seen fur that long on a dog. It looked as if a pelt was thrown on it and hanging loosely. We get home and my aunt says she didn't even see it, though we assumed she slowed down to look at it since my mum and aunt were very big animal lovers and affectionate. We get inside and my aunt drives home. We discuss it and she agrees that it was not a dog. I've experienced the same thing a few times before, but I believe once you know, you can always recognize them. My name is Trace, and last summer my family and I took a trip to England and the surrounding UK countryside. I mean last summer as in 2019, obviously since COVID scrapped everyone's travel plans this year. Just to clarify and avoid confusion with my timeline, I am from the Western United States and enjoy traveling. My family usually takes holidays once a year together around the US, but last year we were going out the country. I used to go every year when I lived with my parents, but I'm 25 now when married and living on my own. However, we still get invited to go on family trips with them, and this is one that had been in the works for years. My parents very generously invited us along and offered to pay for our fares to the UK. We graciously accepted and ecstatically anticipated the adventure. It had been a dream of my father's to return to England for a long time. My father had lived in England for a few years while working for the church. Growing up, he would tell us stories of some of the experiences he had with people he met, as well as the places he had visited. 
the cultural differences, how he missed the food, how the weather was and how the fog would roll in from the ocean and enshroud the city. He also had some otherworldly stories that he did not like to mention or delve much into, and most of the time if he were asked, he would claim to not know what you were talking about. I still do not know all of the details from a lot of these stories. And after being turned away so much from them, I've learned to stop asking. However, my interest in them was kindled in this way. I was extremely excited to visit the UK, since I had grown up hearing so much about it. And on top of that, I love exploring new foreign places and cultures. We started our trip in London, and were to make a road trip up to Inverness and then loop back, making stops along the way. Along the way, we saw that there is a lot of history to behold. There were many places that seemed as if they had been frozen in time from the 1800s. It was an interesting and beautiful trip, as we took a train away from the big city of London to York, and then rented a car to take us back to Edinburgh and Inverness. Cobblestone roads leading up to castles set upon green hills and cliff sides directed my thoughts to the time periods where the feats of men were still in operation for their initially intended use. These country settings forced the infamous mariner's log regarding the lake to mind. He came to me in my sleep. From the foot of my bed I felt a sensation. He took everything. We must return to England. We shall not return here again at the request of the rake. Stories of the rake surfaced and filled through my brain as we drove down the narrow roads of Scotland back to London. We had been in the UK for a little over a week and our next stop along the way was a relatively small town in the Lake District. This town had a lot of tangling cobblestone streets coursing through the tightly packed houses and stories which were all gathered around one thing lining a strip of lake. Outside the town was nothing but countryside for miles. It was very gorgeous and pristine, but also very quiet. I grew up around the wilderness and quiet meadows and mountainsides, although here I felt almost uneasy. The day we were driving in, I started to get sick with a terrible sore throat and cough, and to make things worse, my ears had been plugged up for the entire five and a half hour car ride. We pulled up to the house that would be ours for the next three days in the late afternoon, as the sun was beginning its descent and started to paint the sky yellow. We unloaded our bags and took them inside. There was a kitchen and living room on the first floor and a steep staircase leading to a master bedroom on the left and a second bedroom to the right. My wife and I's room was one on the right. We lugged our bags up and then put them on the bed and then examined our room and bathroom that were connected to the back of the room. There was a window that looked up and down the cobbled stone streets and the other tight houses packed around the U-shaped piece of street that we were located on. Looking out the window from the bed, we could only see the steep stacked roof shingles and the protruding metal chimney pipes. One thing that I found odd was as I first walked into the room, what looked to be an access window to the attic was there. I am used to attic panels being in the ceilings not being quite so big, but these panels were in the wall and maybe a foot above where the headrest of our bed was. It was a three foot by three foot cutout in the wall with two white wooden floorboards matching in size to fit as if to act to some sort of door. The left board fit perfectly into the frame, but the board on the right sat a little further back so that it could be slid behind the left board to allow passage. The right board even had a small hand cut out on the right side of it, proving its purpose was a type of sliding door. I did not think much of it, simply that it was an old place and an attic to me. We then left the house with everyone to go grab dinner for a local restaurant in town. Upon returning from dinner, we retired to our rooms, all of us exhausted from travel. I stayed up for a while talking with my wife and knowing that it was all going to be hard for me to sleep with how sore my throat was. I hadn't had a sore throat that bad since I had strep throat a few years back. As we got ready for bed and laid down, I started to re-examine the room. While looking around at the room, my gaze fixed on the boards to the attic above our bed and noticed that the right board in the attic doorway hadn't been in its framed track for sliding. 
It was at a slight angle, with the top of it leaning up against the top of the frame, from the inside, and the bottom set back slightly into the attic, leaving about a quarter inch gap, if that, along the sides of the bottom position of the board, which allowed a peek at the pitch dark space within the attic. This detail didn't seem incredibly weird to me at the time. What made me uncomfortable was just the fact that we would be sleeping with our heads so close to a door leading into an unknown space that we had not been in or seen, since it was just an attic after all. I hadn't opened the attic because I figured it was none of my business to snoop through someone else's attic. It came time to turn out the light and go to sleep. The atmosphere of the town mixed with my head cold and the fact that we were sleeping under a creepy attic door left me feeling on edge. I figured that the faster I slept, the faster I wouldn't be conscious to overthink and keep myself up all night with my thoughts. It took some time and some cold medicine which ended up knocking me out rather quickly. The next morning as we were getting up and ready for the day, I noticed that my wife Kathy looked very tired. I asked her if she felt sick and she replied that she hardly slept that much. Was I tossing and turning too much? She said it wasn't that, so I asked why. She started to explain that she was woken up in the middle of the night at 2 a.m. by a cold burst of air rushing past her that made all the hairs on her body stand on end. As she lay there trying to shake the eerie feeling of being watched in an attempt to slip back into sleep, she heard a lady's voice faintly begin to cry from behind the boards of the attic. Since my parents were in the room right across the stairway from us, Kathy first thought that it was my mum crying softly in the other room but it was not long until the crying got louder and closer. It sounded like it was coming from directly behind the boards to the attic. Then it would occasionally appear to be coming from higher up in the wall. It was breathy, heavy sobs, followed by a prolonged wail of lamentation. The crying would stop for a few seconds, only to have long and deliberate scratching up and down the wall from within the attic take its place. The woman's voice would start to whine, whimper, and cry loudly again. For over two hours, the crying and scratching were persistent and loud. Then she said, it was as if whatever it was got bored, let out a low-toned moaning noise and slowly ran its nails along the wall, returning deeper into the attic where the crying had faintly started. The quiet of the night returned, but the sun was only about an hour from rising at that point, so she stayed up and cuddled next to me. I was astonished when I heard all this, as anyone should be. Kathy asked my mum just to be sure if she had been crying at all last night, and my mum, confused, said that she had not been. No one else had been awake to hear anything. I decided not to dwell on it, and try to avoid all mention of it happening, because we still had one more night in the place before we were all to leave the Lake District and I did not want that to burden on her all day. After a full day of taking in different sights in the countryside, it was again time to come back into town, have dinner, and settle in for the night. We stayed up a little later, talking and laughing to keep our mind off what was happening, until we were pretty tired. After turning out the light, I felt myself dozing in and out of sleep after seeing that Kathy had fallen fast asleep next to me. I rolled over on my right side facing the window as I felt myself about to succumb to slumber. I felt an overwhelming feeling of being helpless. I froze as I felt like I was being watched from behind. I glanced around the part of the room that was within my viewpoint without moving. I didn't see anything, nothing outside the window either. It definitely felt like I was being watched from behind. My back was now turned to the loose, right side board to the attic, as well as the opposite side of the room where our door to the stairs was. My hairs all stood on end as I lay motionless, now noticing that the air was cold. I started to hear someone running around in the small gravel driveway down below the window where the car was parked. This small driveway was also gated. Footsteps in the gravel happened for a few minutes. Then it got quiet for a little while, not too long after. There were sounds like something had gotten on the roof. Light scratching started on one portion of the roof 
and led to another part above us. This was followed by gravel consequently rolling down the shingles back to the ground below. Then everything got exceptionally quiet, but the feeling of being stalked did not go away. I forced myself to focus my mind on something else. Before long, I was falling back to sleep in the unearthly silence. When I woke up, the sky was a faint, dim blue as morning was about to break. I had only slept for a few hours. The place still felt eerie, but I no longer felt like I was being watched. I remained in bed, staring out the window and contemplating the events that had taken place here over the past two nights while the sky grew brighter. It was not long after that everyone else had started to wake up and get out of bed. We still had to see more, but we needed to pack everything up since we would not be returning to this place. I was grateful to never have to be there again, and after our bags were packed and we were getting ready to take them downstairs to the car, I looked at the attic door. I felt chills trickle down my back and my eyes widened when I realized that the board on the right had been moved. The board had previously only had a quarter inch crack if that towards the bottom before we fell asleep. That last night. And now it was widely and noticeably cracked open nearly two inches. I couldn't help but be terrified to have something that could have occurred to be confirmed by this minor detail. The board was moved. Something or someone had to have moved it while we were asleep through the night. Had we been stalked? Quickly, I packed our belongings into the car and never looked back. While driving away, Kathy and I discussed what had went on. I asked if she'd ever heard of the rake, and she denied ever hearing about it with a confused look on her face. I described a few accounts that I had come across and read and related them back to what happened to us, telling her that I had kept them from her to avoid frightening her any further. No sooner had our car left town did I start to feel normal again. Any unnatural feelings were gone. I never wish to return to the Lake District. Rake or not, I know I don't want to go anywhere near that house ever again. Whatever it is. My boyfriend and I are travelers and live in our van. I am from upstate New York, and he is from Manhattan. I have been living like this for over five years now, and I've seen a lot. One of the best parts about this lifestyle is the people you get to meet from all walks of life and all over the world. Needless to say, we've had a lot of experiences and exposure to different people, and we aren't easily scared by strange behavior or differences. A lot of the time we will camp in national forests, but there are also plenty of nights we spend in Walmart parking lots and home depots and anywhere we can find with overnight street parking. The latter has brought us some sketchy areas where other homeless people camp in bum camps and whatnot, and obviously hardcore drug users in some of these areas are a real thing. With that being said, I went downtown to the Rhino district off of Larimar, and we were looking at mules and street art and taking pictures and just generally chilling. It was almost midnight, and we ended up in an alley behind an old Catholic church when we saw the feet and blankets of someone sleeping in a doorway. Now as another person on the street, even though we don't live in the exact same lifestyle as people who have to sleep under super public like that, I still sympathize as much as possible and try to give them respect and privacy. Like I don't grill them while they're laying there because I can imagine how uncomfortable and demeaning that would be to wake up to. So as we were beginning to pass this person, I keep it in the forefront of my mind not to stare and prepare myself that they might be asleep or maybe awake and look at us and to not be startled. This person was laying in maybe three foot indent in front of an entrance to an old factory behind this Catholic church. No matter how prepared I try to get myself, and no matter how much exposure I have to other people in the street, no matter how prepared I try to get myself, and no matter how much exposure I have to the other people on the street, I could not help but get a surge of adrenaline and fear when we passed by this lady. As we got closer, I glanced over and she was sitting up, slouched in the corner, looking right at us. 
To me, she looked like she could have been native or Hispanic. Her skin was a mix of brown and gray, and she had long, tangled black hair. But what I remember most were her eyes. They were huge and bugged out like they were painfully strained, and you could see her lips pulled back to show her teeth effortlessly. She had a blank expression on her face the whole time. I feel like this is a good place to mention that after spending time on the West Coast, you get crazy accustomed to tweakers and general meth addicts. You can usually always tell when someone has lost themselves to meth, and it is a special kind of crazy, but crazy all the same. And you can feel when someone has lost themselves to this drug, and the decay and neglect of their bodies is apparent. With that being said, this woman did not give off druggy vibes. She didn't look ill and frail because of drug use, and she didn't seem to be fueled by drugs. She genuinely looked sick, like terminal ill type sick. The most messed up part is what she said to us as we walked by. Though Shane was on my left side, my little husky was clipped to me in between us, and the lady was sitting on the ground to my right. And as we passed by, I noticed she was making eye contact, and I gave her a soft, gentle smile and looked down. I don't know what Shane did to her as far as facial expressions and acknowledgement goes, but as we started to pass her, she says in a soft, serious voice with no inflection at all. What's it called when you don't believe in God anymore? And Shane quickly responded, "I think it's agnostic," and we kept walking. As soon as we got out of earshot, I was like, "Shane, why did you scare me so much?" And he was like, "You're okay. It was just a homeless person. No big deal." I had a feeling she was going to scare us, but it's okay. And we kept walking down the alley. At this point, I let Bobby, my husky, off her clip so she can walk around on her own. And she just followed behind us quietly. She never barked throughout the whole ordeal or acted scared at all, and she's losing her eyesight a bit, and hasn't seen it heighten her other senses. And she knows where things are messed up, or if someone's hurt, and will bark and go into defense mode. She went through this whole encounter with nothing. We leave the alley and are in front of these old apartment buildings that reminded us of something you see in New York or even New Orleans. Totally project-looking, almost shotgun houses, and completely out of place for gentrified Denver. We saw them as we drove by before this happened, and instantly felt drawn to them because they were so out of place. There was a kids' jungle gym type thing that they could crawl on, placed on top of a bush in front of the house, which was distinct, but we didn't mention it until later. And there was the haze of a flashing TV screen and someone screaming in one of the houses through the open door. And this was all across the street from the old Omnis Catholic Church. It was just the dark alley, the lady, the creepy church, and the foreign house, the supposed presence of children, and the soft, hazy lighting from the streetlight above. That it was such a mind mess that we felt like we weren't even in Denver anymore, or I hate to be this guy, but like we weren't in 2020 anymore. Later on in the night, we got back to the van, and Shane told me the woman actually terrified him. And that he knew I was scared, but had to act like everything was okay for me, so I wouldn't lose it. He said it was just as unnatural as I felt, and that he didn't think we saw a person. When he said that, I flipped out because it's exactly what I thought too. It was unsettling how we both felt the same thing at the same time, and didn't realize it until we discussed the situation. I also have another story. Last night we were sleeping in the van by the dog park near the boardwalk. And Shane was staying up late doing some art stuff in the van. The way our van is set up is on the left we have a big long window, and then the driver's side window uncovered. Shane heard someone's feet shuffling and dragging, and was curious which tweaker was walking by, and looked out the window to see someone passing. It was at 2 a.m., and he saw a lady wearing a black beach hat resting on top of her head, with really thin balding hair, and you could see her scalp underneath. She turned her head to the side and tried to look through the big side window, and it felt like she was seeing through the window, but not looking at anything in particular at the same time. Her eyes were really deep set and sunken, and it looks like she hadn't slept in a while, but screamed too cognizant to be high. Her skin was pale white, and she seemed to be in her seventies or so. She was really frail and was dressed to go to the beach, which was strange because it was so late at night, dark. 
and chilly for Venice at night. It felt like she wanted people to think she was going to the beach. She was talking to herself, but it wasn't audible, and no human language I've ever heard. It sounded like a radio tuning, like a strange frequency of radio. She didn't notice him, even though they were a few feet away from each other, and she wasn't angry or anything like that. It just felt like she was trying to deceive the world. The craziest part is that there's a plastic divider in between the two windows, and when she walked away from the big picture window, Shane could hear her footsteps, but she never passed by the front one. She didn't cross the street or go behind the van or anything. She walked straight and never saw her pass the second window. I'm so glad I wasn't awake for this, because I would have lost it. As soon as I woke up in the middle of the night, and he told me what happened, I instantly got chills. I don't know what to think about all this, but I would love to hear your theories. Do you think they were regular people? Wolf in sheep's clothing? Cryptids? Aliens? I'd love to hear your thoughts. My freshman year of high school, I was out trick-or-treating with my friends. We got separated into two different groups. It was me, my best friend, and one other friend. We went down the wrong street, and right before we got to the main road of the neighborhood, as you can see the Halloween decorated houses and trick-or-treaters on the other side of the street, was a being. I'm not sure what it was exactly. It looked exactly like a Nayan Zangi spirit standing on the corner of the street. He was watching us as we walked and started walking up to my best friend. She gets scared and I notice it, so I stepped in front of her. The thing got in my face, not saying a word to me. I stood there holding her hand behind me, trying to keep my cool. I looked at it in the eye and told it, Happy Halloween, and it's a great night out, and cool costume. After a minute of keeping my cool, it finally turned around and walked away to the other side of the street, not taking its eyes off us. So we continued on. I told my mum later when I got home and she called my grandfather, who's a medicine man, and I spoke to him about it and was told we were not allowed to wear those outfits outside of ceremonies. I told him how I took it, and reacted. He was thankful I did not get scared, and showed my strength against it. We drove from Mesa, Arizona to the reservation that weekend so he could do a prayer for me and keep me protected. I just didn't think too much about it at the time, but I'm pretty sure I saved my friends from getting hurt by a supernatural being. This happened around five to six years ago. I live in Perth, Western Australia. Me and my best friend lived in the same suburb at the time. We were underage, so when it came to weekends, we usually just went exploring around parks and the quarry in our neighborhood. It was late at night, and we were still wandering the streets near our house, doing whatever we were doing. We died ourselves to go into the quarry at night, which is pitch black and surrounded by bushland. It's a decent sized area, bigger than a football field, and we chickened out at the entrance and decided to sit on a rock just outside it while we were chatting. So to give you an idea of my position, my back was facing the bushes and the quarry, and I was facing towards my friend talking to her. Her face suddenly went blank mid-conversation, and she just froze up for a few seconds before sprinting off and yelling at me to run after her. I had no idea what was going on, but I ended up booking it. Honestly, I thought it was some kind of human threat, like a dodgy person, and we ran for two streets before she managed to stop, and I couldn't get her to talk for a few minutes. She was just absolutely terrified, and told me that when she was talking to me, a face appeared just to the left of my shoulder, probably around one meter from behind me, coming from the bushes. She couldn't really see if there was a body there, just described the face. She said that it was evil and had this menacing presence. I can't get her to accurately describe what she says, but she thinks the features weren't very well defined and that the eyes were blackened out while it wore a grin on its face. Absolutely terrifying. I've got a few weird experiences from my grandparents' house, here in rural Mississippi. 
that I've never been quite able to explain. To start, I'd like to say I'm a very objective and logical person. Not bragging, just my own personality that I recognize. If something happens, I generally never let my mind wander to crazy far-fetched places. The first experience happened when I was 11, while watching TV with my grandmother Mimi. I thought everything was normal until I turned to look at her. She was staring right through me, both eyes dilated and glazed over. Mimi? I asked, and she turned her head unnaturally quickly upwards and reached her hand up and said in a slow, soft voice, It's so fluffy. Soft, airy, touch. And then slowly let her arms down and went right back to watching TV. Obviously, I was in shock and even whimpered a little bit because I just couldn't understand what happened. She heard me and asked if I was okay, and I just kept asking her what she meant and why she did that. But she was confused and tried to calm me down. She didn't remember any of it. She was young for a grandma at the time and never showed any signs of dementia or Alzheimer's since. Nothing at all since that day. And she's always been of sound mind. The next story took place a few years later. I was 15 now, and at the time my brother was 70, and it was pretty late at night. My grandparents' property is surrounded by woods on both sides, leading to a deep forest on the left, one of evergreen, and ending with a lake with other houses within throwing distance. I've grown up my whole life in those woods and have seen many critters and was never really scared of them. They were more of a place of comfort and aloneness. I digress, back to the story. My brother and I were walking up the long driveway that ended at the road. Because we kept hearing noises like moving branches by the tree line, we thought we should check it out. We both knew whatever is in the woods was more likely to be a raccoon, possum or coyote, whatever. We knew that we could easily overpower it if necessary. On our way back from investigating, I heard walking behind us and turned around to see. It was pretty dark, and the only thing we had for light was from my phone, which wasn't much. And all I could see were these two bright eyes staring back, maybe three to four feet from the ground. I don't know what it was, but even now, thinking about those eyes and its presence filled me with the most terrific dread imaginable. It's like all my blood turned to ice, and I couldn't stop shaking. It wasn't just basic instinctual fear, but absolute dread. I immediately grabbed my brother's arm and ran as fast as I could to the porch, which had a light that shines about ten feet into the yard. Whatever this thing was followed us, and when I made it to the porch and turned around, it had stopped just outside of the light, just enough to see those eyes. The way it swayed almost made me vomit. I've never seen any animal sway like that and move its head so oddly. This thing was too large to be a rabid raccoon or coyote. My brother and I quickly got inside and turned off all the lights and hid under our blankets. My brother and I have always loved nature and wildlife. My brother is in the military and I work in the outdoors. We've probably spent more time in nature than anyone we know. We know animals and their distinctive sounds as well as their behaviors. Wolves in particular have always fascinated us because they've always behaved strangely in our presence. The first of these experiences was around 10 years ago. We used to travel to an island near the house that required kayaking for a kilometer to get there. We were walking in the night and suddenly found ourselves surrounded by seven wolves. We used pepper spray against them and went to take refuge in a tree. The wolves stayed all night at the foot of the tree. 
My brother returned there alone afterwards, and one night he was walking, and an animal yelled at him. He didn't see the animal, but the sound of it terrified him. A scream of a man with a deep voice mixed with the cry of a baby. He fired six rounds to where the sound was coming from, and the animal yelled louder and fled. The sound of his footsteps indicated that he was running on two legs. He was big enough to break everything in his path, and we went back and saw many signs of what we thought were associated with a Bigfoot. This story stayed there because we didn't really believe it. My brother later moved 400 kilometers from this place, close to one of Canada's largest protected forests. Whenever we go into this forest, we are there between five or six hours and end up surrounded by aggressive wolves. When we do not leave early enough, we are forced to shoot in their direction in order to scare them off, which doesn't really work. We've been surrounded by wolves at least 10 times. Until recently, I thought it was just a particularly aggressive pack. To leave this wood, we must walk a few kilometers, then take the truck, which requires us to go three to four kilometers in an old dirt road. We were returning quietly during the night, when on my right I saw a white light orb around 30 feet from us in the forest, floating 10 feet high in the air. There was no house or road more than five kilometers away. We believed it was a hunter or hiker in distress with a flashlight. My brother took his rifle and his headlamp and went to see in the woods. He saw nothing and returned 10 minutes later. When he came back, I was scared. First, he arrived from behind the truck until he was about within a meter of the truck. What I saw in the rearview mirror was a grizzly bear. Keep in mind, there are no grizzlies in this area. In addition, I asked him why he turned off his lamp for five minutes. He tells me he never turned it off and he always had the truck in sight. There was no drop where he was and finally, when I could not see his lamp, I saw a moose pass 10 meters ahead of the truck. We were frightened. Finally, he was camping last night with his girlfriend, more than 100 kilometers from this place. During the night, they were awoken again by a pack of wolves that surrounded them. His girlfriend had already reported a year ago having seen this same light orb nearby, and she mentioned that she had seen a grey creature without ears crossing the road on two legs. In short, she didn't think about it until she heard our story. The wolves, the lights, the bipedal creature, a strange impression that we are not welcome a few hours before anything happens. We're not really sure what to believe. Could it be a Wendigo or something else? What do you think?